County, the jury's all present and accounted for. Good morning, everyone. We are back on the record. C-250966, State Nevada v. Thomas Randolph. May the record break that Mr. Randolph was president of the attorney, deputy district on behalf of the state. Do both parties stipulate to the presence of our jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. All right. State, you may recall Detective O'Kelly. State recalls Detective O'Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to pick up his testimony where we left off yesterday. Thank you. Did you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Sophie Gard? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. You can state your name for the record, please. Dean O'Kelly. Thank you. At this time, we're going to resume playing stage 331 at 115.26. Any background briefings for kids at school? No, I don't think so. Okay. We don't have kids at school? No. Okay. Well, if you had them, I'd teach them if I wanted to. Oh, I'm sure. But I don't do that no more. I did it for the first year, but it's here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Am I going to make you nervous if I walk around like this? No, no. Okay. I'm all right. But that's why I met Sharon. Her husband died of cancer a year later. Mine died a year earlier. I was on the Internet. But then I was just in Lizzie fight all the time. Fought for two days and fight for five. That just ain't fun. So. And yes, there's insurance. I've had insurance for 28 years on these policies. And there's some new ones because I picked up a wife and two grandkids and a stepdaughter and stepson. And I was talking about having one more child and a house payment and a pool payment. Probably another $300,000, $400,000 in insurance. But there's, I don't know, $675,000 old insurance. And that's just her. It's my insurance. I'm the one that's really insured. You know, it's just a family plan. She gets 40%, 50% or something. The insurance is for me. And I've always kept it active because, like I said, you might be right. I might only land that plane one time. I might land it upside down. Don't know. But I've had it for a long time. And I said, who would have that much insurance? And I don't know if that makes me a weird man or I'm a weird man. But I've seen so many people who's got insurance. Who got a nice house, three kids, went through college, and a nice wife. But she stays at home and don't work. And she falls over dead from a heart attack, from a stroke. Some crazy fool breaks in the house to steal your gun and shoots her in the head. And you lose your house and your kids don't go to college because you didn't have anything else to fall back on, you know. And I never understood that. But I think we just about covered everything I could possibly think of to cover. So if you've got something else on your mind, spit it out quick. Could you have had, or would there be any reason, and I asked you this the other night when I interviewed you, the night that this happened. Obviously, you know, we've talked to a lot of people. Would there be people that would tell us that maybe you had something to do with this? Yes, because I just want to apologize to my neighbor today because yesterday when he drove by, he smiled at me and I was kind of anxious about picking up Sharon's remains. And I said, don't smile at me. You don't even know me. Why don't you come over and meet me, talk to me, before you fucking talk about me behind my back. And he drove off. And if he would have came back, I think me and him would have probably, I don't know, he's pretty healthy too. He's the boy of the two. But I went over today and apologized to him and said I was just a little anxious. And all he said is he sees the U-Hauls. And I tried to explain to him, two of the times you've seen the U-Hauls. It wasn't 
a fucking thing. And I went and rented them. And there's two minutes of Sharon getting crazy or me getting crazy. Fuck this. I'm not putting up with the shit. I already told you when you start with this shit, I'm gone. Yeah. And when I rented it, put it back the next day. You saw the news reports, right? About what happened at your house. Did you see any of them? All these things, one of the neighbor and one of my car yeah. when he was cleaning. Every time they put one of these news reports on, they always put that caveat at the beginning. Anyone with information, please call Super Witness. You've seen that shit, right? Uh, I got them. Uh, uh, it's there, trust right. me. And so, invariably, you get dozens of calls from people that probably don't even know you, you know, throwing out their hypothesis of as to what might have happened. Okay. And so, you know, that's why I'm just asking you, is there anybody that has anything against you that might say, you know, he had something to do with this? No, because I don't even know any of the neighbors. I did I knew Alex next door. And uh, I did tell him because his house had been burglarized and his wife came home and caught a man with a gun that if that ever happens, just call me and if it comes to my side, I'll shoot at him, but getting back to your side. Alex? Alex, right on this side, on the right. Okay. This is your house, this is the street. It would be the one you're on the spur of the ground. So not the day of Wilmer. The Wilmer. Okay. And his wife came home and somebody was in the house with a gun? Yeah, he had had him do some um, tile work and he fucked it up and he wanted eight grand and it wasn't what they agreed to or something as the story goes and they came and ripped off his gun so it was somebody he knew and his wife came home in the middle of the day and he caught some guy here with a gun and she ran out the back door at the front door and I ran out the back door and they ever swore this guy? I think they got one of the guns back I don't think they ever caught him Did you ever find out whether it was white or black? Uh, actually, I think he, I told him I think it was a black guy because I've seen a, a black older guy walking by two or three times. Could it, uh, um, did you, was Mike already coming over to your house at this point? Oh, no, no, I didn't know Mike did. Oh, so it wasn't Mike? No, it wasn't Mike. I don't know if it was called Mike, sure. But it wasn't Mike. It was, I seen that guy as well. He was, he was an older guy. Oh, that's right. I don't know. It's probably not the same page. Just look up for you. We look for the one. Sharon, if she would have seen somebody in the house, I mean, you know her better than we do, what would her reaction be that? I think she would have fought him. I think she would have fought him. She may have turned and run. She may have just froze, but I think she would have fought him. I really do. I think she would have fought him. Um, but she doesn't see. That's what her disability is. is, is she's, she doesn't see. That's why I was so sick last couple weeks ago. I know I was not filled and might come back from you know, because I had to let her drive all the way home. I got 20 minutes to get out of salt lake. So she's like, I can't see. I'm losing. I drove the end when we got a little further down in the straight section. I said, I can't do it. I'm just not in the mouth. So she goes in the, the house. She walks in through the garage into that hallway. What would have been the first thing she would have done? Because obviously you weren't back in the house yet. Uh, it's my understanding she was going to go wash her pussy and was going to have sex. But that was the plan. When she walks in the house, what does she normally do? Depends on what we've been, what we've been doing. Well, usually, she usually she goes to the bathroom. Usually she goes to the bathroom. Um, did she turn the light on? No, we, uh, big guy. We have a, a holly that comes on the light. It's on a fire timer. It's not a big one, it's a little one, but you can, you can see me around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so she was going to go to the bathroom. That would be my guess. She, she always seemed to go to the bathroom. Okay. Um, and then I remember... But I felt that it was going to be the second half of the movie was going on fuck. Okay. I slept that night. I actually slept. First time slept maybe three, four hours in a row, three hours in a row at least. And got up. Got up. That's 
spiders up that day doing something. Spiders are paintless. Why why was that running around? I was gonna wash the car and fill it up with gas and go get money out of the bank and all that stuff. But, so if she's coming in and she would have seen somebody, you think she would have reacted? I would have hoped she would have ran like hell, but I think She would have came and got me, yes. but you know, then she may have not remembered that she told me to put the gun over that night. And the gun that you were telling me about in that basket, who knew where that one was? In the basket. Yeah. Remember you said that 22 was in the basket? Oh. It's either in the basket or in the drawer. In the drawer. Yeah. My little money. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's also where the pills were.
parents are just fighting that much around the city want to sell, so she wants to sell. And I took a 22 and a couple other guns from my mom as well in the 22. And an ankle thing I didn't set up for church for days, so I did get pictures of these people coming out of the hotels. And I was just tired, I was worn out. And they showed up and we did our little thing. And the boy kept looking at it, and I really liked the boy because I'd known the girl for years and been lovers off and on. I said, oh, Wendy, quit being so silly. It's just like a fucking, it's, it's a hammer. It's a, it's, a, it's a pair of pliers. It's a shovel, for Christ's sake. It's just a tool. It's no safer than, you know, than the person using it. And I says, do you want to see it, Jason? And I started handing this little 22. And then I thought, you know, you've been on some drugs for days. You haven't slept for days. I don't even know if it's loaded. It was in my ankle. And I picked it up, and I went to, just pull the target back to see if there was a shell in it. Shot your finger off. I shot my finger off. And they tried to take my gun license, but you know what was really so fucking just amazingly cool about this? Um, two detectives in Salt Lake City doing a stakeout. And one of them was like, oh, I'm going to kink. And for some reason, he pulled his gun out and shot his partner in the next car, and they gave him killed him. And then another one shot his partner in the stomach. And then one of them in a training class that like happened here in Henderson or someplace. And it says, no guns in the training class at the post academy. And the trainer of the place is in there and his buddy comes in, his partner comes in. And, and wrestles the gun away from him and kills his partner. So, the, uh, what's the moral of it? My a safer place to shoot a person. Uh, I guess it would be which gun he would shoot them with, I don't know. That just take up where it would be the most lethal place to shoot somebody. Uh, wherever, wherever I could, wherever I could. There's, I shoot the body because it's the biggest area. But I'm not a prize shooter because see my back got fucked up and I worked for customs and ADA because I did a little of that for a while too. But you guys didn't have to though, did you? Right? Yes. You did. You're letting me down. I'll have to see if they've ever heard of you. Fuck <laughs> more than one. That was the customs agent's favorite guy. That's who they paid me under. And cash. Always in cash. Don't get nervous. Don't start. Just, you know, try not to tell the 
these guys too much, which I already have, but you already know the shit. What would surprise you? Pardon me? What would surprise you what we know? No, it wouldn't. No? No, it wouldn't. You should know everything there is. I mean, that's fuck the world's, it's all there. You have to do a thorough investigation of that. You have to do everything that you can. So, so what is your, what is your yeah. last letter of shit, Dale? All the arrows. What do you think? You're an intelligent man. I, I don't need to think. I was there. I know exactly. And I was there with somebody else there besides my, my chart. No, you saw all the arrows and everything. He had to be shorter than her because it went up. I think. Yeah. Well, I don't know that much about it either. I mean, because when a bullet strikes a hard surface like a wall or a table or a piece of pipe or a head or, or, or the ground, it sparks. It sparks, chips the concrete, and then hits the fat lady in the leg, and then it skips over and hits the fat boy in the knee. So you can't say that somebody's tall, somebody's short. Well, I thought that's what I'm supposed to say. No, I haven't done this fairly little thing since CSI came out. So just knowing what you know and what you saw that night, where do you think he could have been standing? I don't know. I thought he was in the bedroom. I thought he was in the bedroom because of the only reason, because the clock was down. That's the only reason I thought that. But I can't hear. I cannot get depth perception. And I told you that I got nervous. And then I mean, the next day or two days later, when you came back to the house, I said I remembered that I got freaked out about the bathroom and kind of went and flipped it open thinking there was somebody hiding back there. And I heard something, but I can't ever tell where it was. So I had thought, I figured he was in the bedroom. That's what I figured, but I don't know. And then I thought he was in my bedroom because that was what was being in my mind ransacked at the time because the gun was down, the, the clock was down. But I don't know. I have no idea. Did you ever try to blackmail you? Pardon me? Did Mike ever try to blackmail you? No, actually he didn't. He actually didn't. That was, uh, and he knew about Lizzie and, and well, you know, Everybody knew about Lizzie. Everybody knew about Lizzie except the street. He didn't. He didn't understand. You know what, what the fuck he was going on. I tried to explain that to him. You know, a couple of those times that new law was there. I says I got the new law because I couldn't afford forty thousand dollars a year gambling. And when I came back, when I came back, it was a whole different scenario. I got the bank cards. I got the checks. And I got the joint account. And you get your own account. Whatever you spend, that's fine. You just make sure you put your money in my account, move it over however you want to do it to pay the bills. But it won't be no more than $600, $300 at check fees. Because yeah. that happens again, I'm gone, sure. I'm not doing this. And she stopped. She even stopped gambling for a while. I her cut it way down. But apparently, I just thought she cut it way down because now I'm finding out she's got thousands of dollars and bank cards and the money I gave her is gone. And the uh, 401's gone. And you going to be responsible for all that? Or? I don't know. I don't know. I know I'm going to be responsible for her excess in taxes. I don't see why. Well, it's high rest. Aren't we in their building? Why? Could we might have to get a ruling on that real quick, just so I know. Something else can I ask you, you know what? Well, she come and just tell me I'm under arrest or you just really need to talk to me to clear something else up. I'm probably not coming back out here for at least 30, 40 days, 30 days. Uh, uh, you think we should tell you you're under arrest? No, because if you're already fucked up, you fucked up. This was an easy one for you. This one's an easy one for you because yes. the forensics is there. It has, uh, it has its issues. Um, Instead of instead of going you had questions about what was taken out of the house. I can I pee again? pee again first. Yeah, I'll take it. It's not that I don't trust, but I think I'll take my bag with me. Is your wife good looking? What do you think? To kill for.
It's just talking to myself, yeah. which I do to clear my head sometimes. I called the lawyer and said, Sue, you guys, and I was going to tell you, just ask him, um, just write it off. I straight down, start me if you want, so you know I wasn't wired. If this is going to affect you, because I thought, what the fuck, you guys in the house, you know, in the house. Oh, yeah. It didn't, wasn't it written? Oh, okay. Because it took an hour. I was better about it. Well, that's the nice thing I thought, you know, how did it take so long? Sure, I think it's probably right. No, pardon me. What do you think, Tom? I could never do these with families. I just, you know, I ask them, what do you think? I got a little upset the other night because I thought she laid there on that cold floor by herself and I could be in there with her. Those guys were out fucking around with helicopters and dogs because I didn't know that was going They were in there. When you came out, they took you into custody and they went in. Because I couldn't get a pulse. I couldn't get a, couldn't get a, couldn't get a pulse. So. Alright, so you had questions about stuff in the house. Yeah. Did he have a key?
stop you. Now, is this, you want me to uh, date this the date it happened or the date I got it? No, it's dated as it's there. So the thing that all the properties are counted under is the bank number. And that's from the date that it happened. There's no doubt your forensics, he shot her, you know that. I, I haven't even seen the reports. As a matter of fact, we don't have any reports yet, so that's what we have to wait on. See, because that's one advantage I got over you guys. I say, I know what happened. Well, that's true. Yeah. And the guy that was with you, your partner, I thought he was sleeping. I knew he wasn't sleeping. He was playing the sleeping cop. And the first night was in here. Oh. I don't understand why it was the 22 when you described it. You know, I said that one is ours, but the funny handle grips. Uh, why was it on the clothes or something? You couldn't understand that. Um, I couldn't have done that again if I tried. I was aiming for the garbage can. The sheriff was packing, but he didn't talk so terrible. I guess night clothes or something stacked up there. I don't know what the fuck the line was, but he's talking about all that stacked up on the clothes.
It must be the defendant. Thank you. All right. Are we good now, suitors? Stopping at 154.03. If I could just have a second to take my computer down. Let me do one other thing. I'm sorry. We're going to have to throw some things up here, and I want to make sure that this is set up. So if you could just bear with me, I'm sorry. <coughs>
I want to ask you about Mr. Miller for a second. Um, yesterday we had talked about you looking to see if any had standing warrants because that was something maybe the defendant had mentioned. Do you remember talking about that yesterday? I do. Okay. Did, did you discover whether or not he had any local arrests here or anything like that? No, Mr. Miller had no warrants. Okay. Okay. So no arrests or no warrants that you could find? No. Had he been arrested here, he would have had a, an ID number okay. assigned to him, and he did not have one. During this interview, there is a portion of the interview, do you recall Mr. Randolph looking at you and saying, you know, I don't like you? Do you remember that? I do remember that. Okay. I want to turn your attention to July 2nd, 2008. Do you go over to 6517 Rancho Santa Fe? Yes, I did. Um, do you remember why you had gone over there? As I recall, um, it was to be present in, in what we refer to as a keep the peace type situation where um, the locks were being changed on the house. Okay, so they were being changed over. Who was having the locks changed? And Colleen Byer was. Okay, so does the defendant arrive um, at the house at that time? He did. Um, we were inside the house, and he, he just walked in and, and went over to uh, one of Ms. Byers, uh, Mrs. Byers' uh, ch children and then knelt down and started talking to him. Okay. Does he say something to you at that time? N well, we talked about, you know, this, the agreement between the attorneys, um, you know, that was a civil issue at that point in time. Um, we discussed that we were changing the locks and then we were going to uh, be leaving. There was some suggestion of removing property um, from the house, and I told Mr. Randolph that that wasn't going to happen, that there was already communication between attorneys and, and uh, nobody was taking anything from the house at that point. Um, and uh, Mr. Randolph um, uh, told me that I was an asshole. Um, did you respond to that? I did. I, I said, well, I don't think that I am, but you, you have the right to your opinion. And um, he said, well, you are. And I said, well, that's okay. I don't, uh, I don't take it personally. Um, I later told him the only reason that I, was, that I was standing there in front of him is because I was the next person that was up in rotation. It could have been somebody else, not me. On that day, it, it, it's July 2nd, you have not arrested Mr. Randolph at this time? No. Does Mr. Randolph ask you a question about how long this investigation is going to take? He did. Okay. Um, and, and what do you say to him at that point? Well, that we were making sure that we, you know, got everything right in the investigation. Um, Mr. Randolph responded by saying that, well, as far as he was concerned, that we, that we blew any chance of that happening on the first night. And when I asked him to elaborate, or did you want to add something? Yes, uh, when I asked. Go ahead. When I asked him uh, to elaborate, he said that uh, his attorneys told him not to talk to the police about it. Um, I want to turn your attention to um, that second interview. Um, does the defendant make comments about Sharon's gambling? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, does he talk about the fact that he potentially has to pay back taxes for a former husband of hers? Yes, he did. Does the defendant discuss the fact um, that uh, there is some sort of IRA that Sharon? Yes.
when Ms. Baio was already in the house and the advice that Mr. Randolph was given by his lawyer was in regards to that civil dispute, and you are not to consider that in this case in any way. Go ahead, Mr. Henry. Thank you. Um, did the defendant discuss Sharon's uh, spending when it came to a, an IRA, a $40,000 IRA that she had? Yes, he did. Did the defendant discuss um, how Sharon treated or used $5,000 he gave to her after giving $5,000 to Liz Labrador? Yes, he did. When discussing these topics, um, what was the defendant's what did you did he seem happy about her spending habits no he, he wasn't happy about it at all did he seem happy about having to pay taxes for um, a husband another husband of hers no he seemed quite irritated with that um, did he appear to be happy about the manner in which she gambled no did you say she gambled she gambled okay um, as this investigation continued, did you take steps to uh, recover or s collect gaming records from the from the Santa Fe Hotel? Yes, we did. Did you also uh, seek to collect banking records from a joint joint accounts between Sharon and the defendant, as well as the defendant's own personal bank accounts? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you also um, collect uh, kind of records uh, tracking? potentially any outstanding debts that the defendant may have had. Yes. This time. I'm going to be publishing 328. Did you say 328? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Just bear with me. I got gaming records. Um, let's start with uh, Mr. Miller. So did you did you get did you get records for Miller, Sharon as well as as the defendant himself? Yes, we did. Okay. Let's first start with Mr. Randolph. Um, do you see where it says total in here? Yes. Um, before we get to that, um, the, what is the time range on this set of gaming records? It's a when? it's a one month uh, range from four nine to five nine of 08. Okay, and what's the total amount um, that Mr. Randolph uh, had spent total in on that last month before Sharon passes away? Four hundred and sixty two fifty. Miller's records. Now this one doesn't have an overall total, but have you kind of calculated 
how much it is when you add up all of these coins in? Yeah, so it was around $1,900. Okay. And just to be clear, um, that's kind of, it, it deals with, you've got here starting on kind of May 7th, and it goes all the way down to February. So from February to May 7th, it's approximately $1,900. That's correct. Look at Sharon Randolph. What is the date range from here? Uh, the same as with Mr. Randolph from 4 9 of 08 to 5 9 of 08, one month. So this is the last month of her life, correct? Yes. How much money did she put in the slot machines in that month? Uh, Twenty three thousand four hundred and sixty eight dollars and seventy cents. Opening up the folder of banking records. Did the Randolphs have a joint account at Wells Fargo? Yes. Opening Randolph Joint Bank Account. And these records span from January of 2007 all the way to July 31st of 2008. Is that correct? Yes. First going to go to page 221, these records. If you could, can you please read to me what's the date here? That's April 30th of 2008. Yeah. I'm not sure these are admitted yet. Not that we would have an objection, but I... 328 was admitted yesterday. They're all good. Okay. That's why I clarified it was 328. It was. And it, it's, it's on the same CD with the insurance. Yeah. How many, what is their total amount of assets at the end of April? $1,041.60. And with this, with this account, for this specific account, what are their total liabilities? It shows um, $39,897.11. And that's, that's eight days before she's passed away, correct? Correct. Uh, there, there, does there appear to be kind of a home equity line of credit associated with this account? Yes, this shows an interest rate there, and it's increased from the previous month. Okay. Now going to 228. Not 228, I apologize. 227. What's the date of this, uh, of this statement? May 31st of 2008. So this is obviously the, the end of the month in which Sharon passes away on, on the 8th of May, correct? That's correct. At the end of this month, what was the total amount of assets? $2,297 even. And it, and it started obviously with the ending balance for the prior month of $1,041.60, correct? Correct. What, what were the total liabilities? 39867 so it's actually uh, decreased in making payments, apparently. Okay. But still a, a, a negative balance of approximately $37,000 without the, of course, subtracting the assets from the liabilities? Yes. You did also acquire, though, a bank account through Washington Mutual that related only to Mr. Randolph, correct? Yes. records span from August of 2007 all the way to May, uh, the end of May of 2008. Is that correct? Yes. I'm going to go 
to page 17. Well, before we do that, let's go to the beginning. In the beginning in this account, how much money, let's, let's look at the date here, and, and I apologize, I just don't have my mouse here, so it's a little harder for me to navigate. Okay, so this is on page three. And can you see the upper right hand corner? It's stating that this covers essentially the month of August. Would that be correct? That's correct from 8 6 to 8 22 of 07. And it looks like their payment periods probably start um, a little bit earlier, but this is apparently when the account is open on 8 6 of 07, correct? Yes. Okay. There was $117,000 approximately $939.17 in deposits made in this account when it first opened, is that right? Yes. What is the ending balance <laughs> at the end of this month? $86,919.17. Okay, now that's August of 2007. Correct. I want to turn your attention to the month in which Sharon passes away. I'm going to page 17 these records. Can you sh read me the statement period from when to when? Uh, from uh, April 23rd of 2008 to May 22nd of 2008. Please tell me what the beginning balance was at the beginning of this uh, statement period. Um, is the cursor right there? Is that an eight or a three? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's right. Uh, 815, uh, $815.35. And there was a withdrawal made on April 28th, right? Yes. How much was that? Uh, $800. And that's prior to Sharon's death, is that correct? That's correct. What is the ending balance in this account? Uh, $15.35. Opening uh, the Equifax records. Um, these Equifax records tracked um, kind of outstanding debts that he had financially, correct? Yes. With respect to an American Express account, you see the balance that says date reported is June of 2008, is that right? Yes. What is the balance amount? $404. With respect to this Bank of America account, the reported date is 2008. What is the balance amount? $152. Going to page six of the records. Going to page seven of the records. With respect to Chase Bank, the top of the page seven, the date of June of 2008, what is the balance amount? $7,628. With respect to the second Chase Bank account, June of 2000. Just clarify whether we're dealing with bank accounts or credit cards. Okay. Well, Chase, Chase Bank, we'll just do it this way. Chase Bank USA, account number 426-684-106085. What is the balance amount? $7,628. There's a second account under Chase Bank of 5222 seven six three zero zero nine 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 as of june of two thousand and eight what is the balance amount twenty thousand four hundred ninety one dollars with respect to citibank bank account five four two four one eight zero eight six four three eight um, as of july two thousand eight what is the balance amount sixteen dollars moving on to page eight with respect to Citibank, account number 5424188207. As of June of 2008, what is the balance amount? $5,781. With respect to a Sears account of 5049948023553, as of June of 2008, what is the balance amount? $706. Moving on to page 10, moving on to page 11. 
Wells Fargo account 6506-500979047. As of June of 2008, what is the balance amount? $39,254. And essentially that matches up with that home line of credit from those Wells Fargo's records. Exactly. So when you added, added that amount up, did it come out to approximately $84,808? Yes. I'd like to have, almost undetected, but if I could have at least these three uh, marked. Admission uh, states 333, 334, 335. Um, Ambrose Lewis? Yes, are those being admitted? Uh, I believe so without objection. Yes, you are. Dr. Holmes will be admitted. Showing you states 333, who's that? Um, Tom Randolph. Showing you 334, who's that? Michael Miller. Showing you 335, who's that? Sharon Randolph. Okay, we all would ever. Can I have those back? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Publishing 333, 334, 335. So, just to be clear, um, you had mentioned you calculated approximately $84,000 in money owed. Um, approximately how much life insurance um, would he have been a beneficiary of in light of Sharon's death? Approximately uh, $332,000. And underneath the very first will from June of 06, did he also stand to inherit uh, the house, 6517 Rancho Santa Fe? Yes. Uh, did the will also enable him to inherit any potential bank accounts that were out? Yes. Open? I have no further questions from Swiss. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a brief recess before we start cross-examination of this witness. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, listen to any news or media accounts or commentary about this case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionary, using the internet, or using reference material. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form a press any things in your other states in the process of the Ladies and gentlemen, the 10 will be in recess till 10 30. All rise for the jury.
will rise for the jury. Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Long, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, Counselor. Detective O'Kelly, it seems that what you told the jury yesterday is that there was a briefing that occurred in the late hours, early morning hours of May 9, 2008, that you became aware of. Yes, it, briefing, right? it, was, on, it was on May 8th, okay. yes. And you told the jury that based upon the briefing and you heard uh, during this briefing what Mr. Randolph thinks he had said it occurred inside the house, right? Yes. And you became suspicious of some of those things, didn't you? Not at that moment, not during the briefing. You became suspicious as a result of talking to Detective Mogg about things that he talked to Mr. Randolph about, again, in the early morning hours of May 9th. Yes, that was early morning when Mr. Mock, when uh, Detective Mock came back to the house. Okay, so let's look for a second, if we could, at States Exhibit 287. Okay, do you see that? That's a picture of Sharon and uh, Thomas Randolph. Would you agree with that? I agree. Okay. Then I want to show you a picture of 334. Who is that? That's Michael Miller. Okay, so now one thing we definitely know that occurred on May 8th, 2008, is that man, Michael Miller, murdered Sharon Randolph. Is that right? I agree with that. Michael Miller took out a 38 caliber gun and put it on the back of Sharon's head and shot and murdered, didn't he? Mm, I don't know that we have evidence of a contact wound, but he shot her in the head with a 38, yes. If I was to tell you that the medical examiner told the jury that it was a contact wound, would you have any reason to dispute it? I don't have any reason. And you would agree with me that Michael Miller killed Sharon Randolph, who was married to Thomas Randolph, right? Yes. That was Sharon's husband, right? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, that was a weird appearance. Yes, that's Thomas Randall. And that's Sharon Randall. Yes, it is. Sharon Randolph. Strike that. Thomas Randolph told you that on that night he had been to the charcoal room, correct? Correct. And police obtained video of Thomas Randolph and Sharon Randolph at the charcoal room. Yes, we did. We saw video of that yesterday. Yes, we did. And we actually see them leaving together, don't we? Yes. And do they appear to be hand in hand? Yeah, they appear to hold hands the entire time. And so what Thomas Randolph told Detective Mogg turned out to be true about being at the charcoal room, right? Yes. When he talked to police officers at the scene, Thomas Randolph, he didn't have an attorney, did he? No. When Thomas Randolph talked to Detective Mogg later that evening, early morning hours of the night, he didn't have an attorney, did he? No, he did. He told Detective Mogg that he had gone to Funny's gas station, didn't he? Yes. And police obtained video of Funny's, didn't they? Yes, we did. And it showed exactly what Thomas Randolph said. He had gone there, they made a purchase, and then they had gotten gas. That's correct. With regard to the funnies video, it was introduced, but there's two of them, one by the defense and one by the state. Did you have anything to do with when the video was cut off showing the car leaving, the Randolph car leaving? Did you have anything to do with that? I, I didn't see that it was cut off. Okay. I must have missed the, I mean, I didn't see both 
that you're talking about. So I only did saw one. See, did you see the vehicle leave and then head towards a stoplight and that they had the stoplight, uh, the, the vehicle stayed there at the stoplight for approximately a minute? I don't think that we played it that long, no. Okay. But that would definitely go to the timeline, wouldn't it? It, it would show that they stopped at the stoplight and then drove after it turned green. You were asked questions about a timeline in this case because what you were trying to show is that, and I think you said, that the Randolphs got home conservatively at 8.30 p.m. That's approximately 8.30 p.m., yes. Based on leaving the funnies and the time that it would take to get home, yes. Okay, but you taught, you're aware that there's a Michael Bartlett who was a neighbor, correct? Yes. And Michael Bartlett told authorities that he was on the phone talking to his friend when some of these events occurred. Do you remember that? He yes. was on the phone, he heard gunshots. Yes. Okay. He also has told this jury that when he was on the phone, he saw the Randolph car show up. Did you know that? I wasn't present when he testified in front of this jury. Okay. So... If, what time did the phone call start? Uh, 20, 33, 36, so 8, 33, and 36 seconds p.m. And it lasted for 270 seconds, correct? Yes. So we know that if Mr. Bartlett was on the phone at 8, 33, 36, and he sees the Randolph car show up, they couldn't have showed up at 8, 30, because it has to be after 8, 33, 36. Do you agree with that logic? I don't know that I would call it logic. I would say that it took over seven minutes for them to get home. That's not my question. Mr. Bartlett said he was on the phone and he saw the Randolphs coming home. He saw them, the garage door open, he saw them enter, he saw the garage door close. Okay? Okay. That means that the Randolphs came home after 8.33, 36. Do you see that? According to Mr. Bartlett's statement, as you describe it, then I would agree. Because obviously you didn't know that fact, right? It just became apparent to you right now that Mr. Bartlett saw them come home while he was on the phone. Uh, again, I wasn't here for the testimony, but I'm okay. aware of his statement that night. So it's fair to say you never tried to duplicate how long it takes for the Randolph garage door to open, Miss Randolph to go in, Mrs. Randolph to go in, the vehicle to come in, and the garage door to close, plus 25 to 30 seconds. You never did that, did you? Plus the 25 to 30 seconds. Of he, he said he didn't hear, he heard shots after the door, garage door closed, plus 25 to 30 seconds. Okay? okay? Did you ever do any kind of experiment like that? Mm, and we did the walkthrough video the, the week following with Mr. Randolph. Okay, with regard to what Mr. Bartlett had said, are you saying you just didn't know this? Are you saying you just didn't know this information regarding the timeline? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Mr. Bartlett's uh, version has testified yes. in front of this jury. Yes. I, again, I wasn't present during his testimony. Okay. Mr. Randolph told you that he had difficulty hearing. He said that over and over in different interviews, didn't he? Yes, he did. Okay. But he tells you that when he enters the home that evening, Something spooks him. Do you remember that? Yes, after he entered the door. He saw Sharon Randolph lying, he said, in the center of the hallway down by the master bedroom. Isn't that what he said? Yes. And in fact, you found Sharon approximately in that area. I'd say approximately, yes. In other words, it wasn't in the front room or in the garage or anything like that. It was pretty accurate as to where she was. Yes, right? within a couple of feet, yes. He tells you he sees this red bag that was, uh, he at first was unsure what it was, but it was actually the, the take-home uh, food from the charcoal. Do you remember that? I do. And he said that he thought it was blood at the time. Then at some point he says he sees something out of his eye. He sees something, but he doesn't quite know what it is. Do you remember that? Right. Either something jumping across in, from one room to the other or someone poking their head out and ducking back in. He then says he goes into, and I'm showing States Exhibit 214. I want to concentrate on the hallway. 
He says he sees somebody down towards or sees something towards the east bedroom, just for lack of a better purpose. He, he may not say east bedroom, but down towards where Miss, Mrs. Randolph is. Right? Exactly. We're calling it the drum room. That's where the drum sets at. Okay. He then says he pops into the northeast bedroom to what's depicted in that sort of box. That's, I guess, a, a way to describe the closet, right? I agree. Where the, the 9 millimeter uh, semi-automatic is kept. In a hanging shoe rack, yes. He says he grabs it, doesn't he? Yes, and, a, and a, an extra magazine. An extra clip, yes. An ex he says clip, but it, it, the proper term is magazine. That's right. That's correct. Okay, so he puts this magazine, takes the magazine, he takes the gun. He says as he comes out of that room, he bumps into Mr. Miller. Pretty much bumps into him. Yes. Now, if you were standing where Sharon is, you see that? You're standing, looking down that hallway, okay, in that proximate area. And somebody had popped into the northeast bedroom to get something from the closet. You wouldn't see him, would you? There. Not while they were in there, no. So Mr. Miller is then, at some point, we presume proceeding down the hallway, bumps into Mr. Randolph, according to Mr. Randolph, right? Yes. Mr. Randolph tells you, and he repeatedly says, that he sort of pushes him back because it's sort of startling, it's a frightening situation, right? Correct. Then he tells you that he shoots him as many times as he can, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Now, I want to talk to you about perforating injuries. Mr. Miller, this murderer, had five injuries, bullet shots to him, didn't he? Well, if you're talking entry and exit on four... No, I'm not talking entry and, and exit. an entry. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying he, had, okay. he suffered five gunshots. Yes, five gunshots. One of those gunshots was penetrating, but not perforating. Correct, the one to his left side. To his chest? To his mm. chest area? No, to his left side. Okay, I'll come back to that. One of the injuries that comes in the front of Mr. Miller is non-perforating, correct? No, that one exited um, up here next to his, uh, his right collarbone. Okay, I'm going to show you a. If I showed you a copy of the autopsy report, would that refresh your memory as to exactly what uh, gunshot wound to the less left lateral aspect of chest would be? Okay. Permission to approach you. Yes. Thank you, Detective. Do you see I'm showing you what appears to be the autopsy report? Yes. Okay, does that, if you look at that, does gunshot four appear to be aspect of the chest? To the left lateral side of the chest. See that? Yes, I do. Okay, it's not, it's not perforating. It's penetrating, right? Intact, small to medium caliber, copper jacketed projectile. Yes, on that particular wound, yes. So on that wound, on the chest, the bullet was found inside his body, correct? Yes, the one to the left side of his chest. <coughs> So we know that Mr. Miller took a front shot that went in and did not come out. That one that I just showed you, right? The one to the left side of his chest, yes. Yes. Remember yesterday you told the jury that you would expect to see a bullet strike. If a, bu a bullet is through and through, I'll just use that term. When I say through and through, what, what does it mean to you? It's a perforating gunshot wound, through, okay. through and through, yeah. But if a man is shot in that hallway and the bullet stays in the body, there'll be no bullet strike other than to his body, right? That would be correct. And if Mr. Randolph had shot Mr. Miller that time, which he did, did it go through the body, we do find a cartridge in the hallway, don't we? 
Yes, by the by the door to the garage. That's listed right here. It's number three, right by Mr. Miller's feet. That's correct. Inside, right? Yes. Now, I want to talk to you about how far it is from that doorway in the northeast bedroom to the heels of Mr. Miller in this picture, okay? We have a graph. Do you see that graph at the top? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really zoom into it if I can. Do you see that five? There's a five-foot graph, right? Yes, I do. And so uh, that's what that means is that is approximately five feet within that, within that diagram, right? Yes. So now if we go back up to the hallway in the bedroom, you see from where my figure is the doorway to the northeast bedroom. And again, I want to concentrate on where Mr. Miller's heels are. Would you see with that graph that that's about five feet? From the uh, northern uh, edge of the door, yes, door frame, sir. yes. So it's fair to say that from where Mr. Randolph comes out, says he encounters Mr. Miller, until Mr. Miller is laying dead is approximately five feet. Fair? Well, Mr. Randolph is in the center of the door, so you'd add you know, probably but another you, foot and a half. You don't know where he was, right? You, you weren't there. You don't have a video. Fair? No, he told me where he was. He said he came out of the room, right? He's standing in the threshold of that room when he fired the first shot, according to him. Okay. When most people shoot, they extend their hands. Right? That's correct. I mean, proper shooting, you know, is to extend it all the way. It depends right? on the shooting okay. incident, the yes. Shooting. But most people, most people don't shoot like this. No. They bring their hand up. Correct. Even, I mean, you and I are reasonably small men. Fair? I am average height, officially, five foot nine. <laughs> I'm a little smaller than that. When I put my hand out, when I put my hand out, would you agree that's at least 12 inches? Yes. Right. There was no soot or stippling on the body of Michael Miller, correct? No. Which tells us that the gunshots are coming from the barrel of the gun approximately two feet or more away. I'd agree with that. So we're dealing with this five-foot area, and if Mr. Randolph comes up, now presuming that Mr. Miller's heading towards the garage door, his arm is extended, you'd agree with me that's at least a foot, right? Yes. And you'd agree with me that Mr. Miller must be at least two more feet away not to receive stick. No. Uh, in this case, Mr. Miller was wearing a thick uh, hooded sweatshirt and another shirt underneath. That so was, was, was his clothing tested for stippling? Yes or no? The clothing? Yes. Stippling doesn't occur on cloth. Burning doesn't occur? They can't see burning on the, cloth? The, the fragments from the rounds, you could have an indication that they had hit the fabric, but stippling is, a, is a, like a small contusion that occurs on the skin because of those fragments hitting it. So the very fact that there is none of this on Mr. Miller shows that he is some distance from the gun. Correct? It's not on contact. His, on his skin or on the clothing? Either one. Well, again, I wouldn't expect to see it on his skin because he had a thick sweatshirt on and a shirt underneath that, so you wouldn't see it on How his skin. How about on his clothing? On his clothing, there would pre there'd be gunshot residue and soot. And there wasn't here? Well, we didn't have it tested for gunshot residue. So so you didn't have tested for gunshot risk. I did not, no. So even with a foot, we're talking about five feet. If he takes up an injury that penetrates his body, right? And then he turns around and he starts going out that door. Again, for big guys, like some of these big guys, that's about five feet. Easy? What I just did? Two big steps? Easily, yes. Those aren't big steps. And Mr. Tomchek, come out here. It'd be a lot bigger, right? But that's five feet, right? Big step is about a yard. Yes. So in this area, this five-foot area, Mr. Randolph told you he came out or he comes in contact with Mr. Miller. 
He shoots him as many times as he can, and he shoots him into the garage, doesn't yeah. he? Yes. He tells you, excuse me, in his very first statement to Detective Bogg, he has asked, did he shoot Mr. Miller in the garage? Do you remember this? Yes. And he said, he's actually asked, did you fire shots with an S, shots in that garage? And he says yes. Yes. Okay. Is, that right? is that correct? Yes. So what we know is that Mr. Randolph shot Mr. Miller in this five-foot space in the hallway, right? Yes. And that he also shot him shots in that garage, right? Yes, they had shots. Okay. Well, he says shots, he, and then he at some point talks about later on how he comes and shoots him in the head, correct? He said he shot him as many times as he could until he went down to the floor of the garage. Okay. And then at some point he shoots him a couple of times in the head. Right. He had come back into the house to see how things were, and then he said he heard the fire extinguisher fall, and so well, he did shot Did he really him. say that, Detective? Did he really say he heard the fire extinguisher, or did he say he heard a loud noise and assumed, because he saw the fire extinguisher, that that's what it was? That's accurate. Okay. And, in fact, there was a fire extinguisher on the ground. There was. Would you agree with me, irregardless of a fire extinguisher, that M Miller, who murdered his wife, that in that quick few seconds, he had a right to shoot Miller as many times as he wanted to till he went to the ground and died. Is that fair? He had a right to do that because he said he had a gun and he was defending himself. I agree with that. And he just murdered his wife. Add to that, yes. But put a big hole in her head. Yes, he did. After they were holding hands minutes before. Yes, they were. Enjoying Mother's Day at the charcoal room, right? They were at the charcoal room, yes. When we look at Mr. Miller, we know he's a thief, don't we? You know he was a thief, right? Did I know he was a thief? I mean, we had in his property, there were some identification and some cards that belonged to another person. So I don't know if he stole it. I don't know if he had it on him, if he found it, but. Okay, and, well, let's start with that. So in his left, excuse me, in his wallet, he has some ID, doesn't he? Yes. It's not his. Yes, that's right? true. And that is from a person named Michael Hogue, isn't it? Yes. And it wasn't just his driver's license, it's also a, a card uh, for, I think, food stamps. And Costco, I think. Where did you locate and interview Mr. Hope? Could you give me the date you interviewed Mr. Hope? I did not interview him. Where, wh when was the date that detectives that you caused to interview Mr. Hogue. What date did they interview Mr. Hogue? I don't believe Mr. Hogue was ever interviewed. So you've told this jury that you suspect that Mr. Miller is a thief because he had Mr. Hogue's identification on him. Fair to say? If he took Mr. Hogue's wallet, then he's a thief. You never went and talked to Hogue, did you? No, I did not. In the 60 witnesses you interviewed, you didn't think it was important to go and establish whether Mr. Hogue had his stuff ripped off, right? I, I never spoke to Mr. Hogue, Hogue. I don't know if he had his stuff ripped, ripped off or if he lost his wallet. I don't know if it was taken. Well, did. even if he lost his wallet, that doesn't give Mr. Miller the right to shove it in his wallet, does it? No, and for all I know, it could be Mr. Hogue's wallet that he had. I have no idea. Okay. There was also something in Mr. Miller's left pocket that was of interest, right? Yes, there was. It was a channel set, a diamond channel set gold attorney, wasn't it? 
It was gold and it had clear stones. Yes, and it was channel set. And when you say clear stones, you're not a jeweler, are you? That's correct. What, what was the appraisal on that when you had it, con when you, when you had it appraised? We, we never had that appraised. Yesterday you told the jury that, that uh, the jewelry was costume. Do you remember saying that? The, primarily in the bag that we found was costume jewelry. With regard to this ring, this ring was most certainly not costume jewelry, was it? If in fact it was diamond and it was gold, then it was definitely not costume jewelry. Okay. And he specifically had it in his left pocket, right? Yes, he did. And that led you to believe that he was stealing Sharon Randolph's jewelry, right? I, have, I believe he had every intention of leaving the house with Sharon Randolph's jewelry, yes. And... I'm showing what's being marked as, or admitted as State's Exhibit 196. Do you see that? I do. That's the channel set ring that you were talking about. Okay. Amongst the change that he had in his pocket. Court's indulgence. Did you check the worth of that ring? No. It's not cosmetic, though. If, in fact, it's diamond and it's gold, then it's not cosmetic or costume, excuse me. Okay. And that was what was in his left jeans pocket, right? I don't see the placard, but I, I would agree with I have no reason to dispute it. Yes, left front jeans pocket. So, obviously, Mr. Miller thought that that was particularly important. Right? Because he put it in his left pant pocket. I would expect. And he also put a whole bunch of jewelry into the, a Walmart bag, didn't he? We found a, a fabric Walmart bag filled with jewelry and a towel and a T-shirt, yes. Was there a gold, solid gold antique watch amongst that jewelry? I do not know. Would you agree with me that a solid gold antique watch could not be considered cosmetic or, cos uh, or costume? Yes. Would you I would agree with that. Okay. Would you agree that there were multiple gold hoop earrings in there? Yellow metal hooped earrings, yes. We don't value them. Because uh, when you say yellow metal, that's because you did not have these this stuff appraised, did you? We did not. Was there a towel that that jewelry was wrapped up in, in the back? There was a towel in the bag. The jewelry was all mixed in, and there was a T-shirt as well, along with the key to, to the house and the key to the safe and then the high-security keys. Did you cause that white towel to be tested? No. Did you, in fact, turn over all of that jewelry to Sharon's daughter, Colleen? Did you give it to, to her? No, I did not give her. What happened to the jewelry? jewelry. We photographed, we laid it out in the, on the dining room table and photographed it to document it for our case file, and it was left at the scene. It was left at the scene? It was left in the house. I, I didn't turn it over to anyone. You never turned that? You just left it there? As far as I know, I don't, I don't, I don't know who it was turned over to. It was never impounded? No, it was not. So you just looked at it? What about the coins? Do you remember there's some gold and what appeared gold metal, silver metal coins in there? I don't remember. Would you agree with me that when somebody gives a channel set diamond and gold ring to somebody, they may feel proud of that? Would you agree with me that the display of jewelry we saw, that there are a lot of human beings who would be proud of their, of their jewelry. Certainly. They would think maybe that to them it has value, right? Yes. It, it, it matters perhaps what income level you're at, right? Depending on the kind of jewels you can afford. I'd agree with that. Okay. Bill Gates can afford more expensive jewelry than somebody who may be struggling.
There that. would have been no costume jewelry there, yes. Okay. This state 201 is a picture of the Costco card, the Advantage card, and the California driver's license of Mr. Hogue, isn't it? Uh, there, yes, there are some Michael Miller um, documents and cards in there as well. You would agree with me that that man, Mr. Hogue, looks nothing like Mr. Miller, correct? He does not. So now I'd like to go through some of Mr. Randolph's statements. In his first statement, now you told the jury this story about the, the garage light. Do you remember and the, the garage light made no sense to you because you timed it. It's five minutes, eight seconds, and it turns off, right? Correct. Okay, so what we're telling the jury, or what you're telling the jury, is that if somebody comes in their garage door, <coughs> the door opens, and when the door closes, the light in the garage will stay open for approximately five minutes, eight seconds. On this particular garage door, not on everybody's. Okay. But you checked it three times, and it's five minutes, eight seconds. You said it was, that's pretty close, maybe five minutes, seven seconds, but it was... Five minutes, eight seconds. All right. And so what you concluded is because you were going from 8.30 at night, because you were unaware of what Mr. Bartlett had said, you were concluding that if the garage door closed 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, it would, the light would go off after seven minutes. Fair? Or after five minutes, eight seconds. Correct. So if it was, let's say, 8.32, it would go off at 8.37. Correct. And yet Mr. Randolph, was started the 911 call at 8.44, 54 seconds, correct? That's correct. And so the light would have already been off, right? Yes. Didn't Mr. Randolph say in both the walkthrough and the initial interview at, on May 9th in the early morning hours, that either he had tried to, after, after the events, at some point he tried to go out to the garage, either Mr. Miller was going out to the garage and pushed the button, or that Thomas Randolph was going to tell a neighbor and started pushing the button to the garage door and closed it. Do you remember this? I remember that Mr. Randolph, when he stepped in and he saw Sharon laying at the other end of the hallway, thought for a moment to go to a neighbor, so he hit the garage door and then closed it again at that point. That's what he described to us. And yes, in the other statement, he talked about uh, that the light had gone out and he, he turned it back on and then was in the garage and the light went out, but it was okay, a so much shorter period of time. So that would reset the light, wouldn't it? His yeah. effort? Yes, okay. So now we know that we really can't rely upon the five minutes starting from when the garage door first closes because he reactivates it, fair? He did. As soon as he stepped into the hallway, it started. He also told the authorities, told police, that he believed Miller was trying to open the door. <coughs> yes. Garage door. Right? As, he was, as he was going out into the garage, he thought that Mil Miller might be reaching for the garage door opener. For the garage door opener? Because he says it, doesn't he? he actually... Well, he initially says that he goes to the door, that he went to the door, to the garage and then he thought that he had turned he had turned back and that he might have gone for the garage door opener yes he says i mean the garage door opener and you ask where or detectives ask where the garage where's the garage door opener and you he says you come in the door and just reach around and you can turn on the light right that's what he said right so that most certainly would reset this whole timing thing on the light wouldn't it it would if he reached it yes So it's fair to say that what you told this jury about the five minutes, eight seconds is accurate. It's five minutes, eight seconds. But every time somebody touches that, it reactivates it. Fair? That's fair.
that night, did you go to the Millers, Billy Miller, and Peter Miller's home? I did not. But you know that Vita and Billy Miller said that they were miss missing some cloth gloves. Do you remember this? Yes. In fact, you memorialized that in a report, that both Billy and Vita said that they were missing cloth gloves. Yes, and a ski mask. Okay, well, thank you. We'll get to the ski mask in a second. But, okay. but uh, just so we're clear, because there was a point where it was important we prove this gl these gloves, Mr. Miller didn't remember that. You can tell us that Mr. Miller, in fact, said he was missing a pair of cloth gloves. Yes. And you found gloves on Michael Miller, didn't you? Yes, we did. Polyester cotton gloves. And one thing polyester cotton gloves do is they stop me from leaving fingerprints. If I want to be working on this thing and I don't want anybody to have my fingerprints if I wear gloves, it'll help me. Fingerprints and more than likely DNA, yes. It'll stop it, won't it? Correct. You, people have housekeepers that clean houses, right? Yes. People have handyman, hand, handy woman that do things around the house, right? Yes. Sometimes those people are in uh, more not public areas, but they're doing things around the house, but maybe they shouldn't be going in. Uh, housewife, house husbands, nice standards. Fair? That's possible, certainly. So you would be aware that Mike Miller would have been in that house, the Randolph house, multiple times, right? Yes, we were told that he was. He had done work for Colleen, right? I think on one occasion there were some... Work that he did. Right. Yes. Okay. You were aware that Mike Miller had watched movies over there? Yes. Being invited to Easter dinner? I don't remember Easter specifically, but I know he's, they said that they, he had had dinner there several times. Fair enough. Mr. Randolph told you he trusted that man, didn't he? Yes. And he told you after the death, he, he referred to him in a column of bum. Do you remember that? I do. He said he didn't have any talent with screw driving or pounding a nail, but he could lift stuff, right? Correct. And that helped Mr. Randolph because he's got a bad back, right? Yes, he said he does. But Thomas Randolph said repeatedly that Mr. Miller didn't have a drug problem. Do you remember that? I know he was asked about it and, and then clarified it that it was a drinking problem. Okay. But he answered initially to the question about drugs. And at one point he says he doesn't even smoke pot, right? Right. Well, that was wrong. Mr. Randolph was absolutely wrong because this man, Michael Miller, had cocaine in his system. Were you aware of that? I didn't see the toxicology report on Mr. Miller. So one thing we can tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury is Mr. Randolph was wrong. He thought, he, tr he said he trusted the man. The man didn't even smoke pot. And we know that he did something a lot more powerful than that, right? Cocaine is a lot more powerful than pot. If he had, a co if he had cocaine in his system, then yes. You were a bike cop for a while, I think you said. Uh, bicycle, mountain bike. Yeah, I rode mountain bikes for two years. Okay, and when was that? That was back in uh, 93 to 95, over by Clark High School. So as a uh, bicycle cop, you probably were dealing in some low-level narcotic stuff, people under the influence, things like that. Certainly. It was high-density, low-income housing, so a lot of gang members. Okay. And... You probably have some ability to spot back then when people were under the influence of different control substances. Yes. Do you agree with the following statement? That violent behavior and crime are associated with cocaine use and that paranoid thinking and the need to get money for cocaine may cause violent criminal Objection. behavior by Objection. cocaine Objection. users. Objection.
You said you were a bicycle cop. Yes, I was. For a couple of years. Yes. You said you worked gang uh, territories. Yes. A and in those gang territories, did you uh, happen to make arrests for cocaine? Yes. Do you know the effects? Do you know, as a police officer, the effects of cocaine on our society? Generally, yes. Oh, on our society? Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a blight on our society. It's, it's awful that people are addicted to cocaine. Could you repeat that, please? It's a blight on our society that people are addicted to cocaine and crack cocaine. Why? Because they're not... Con It is fair to say that uh, you examined the inside of that scene, correct? Yes. Okay. You looked for different different things. Did you look at the master bedroom? Yes, we did. Okay. Did you notice that beyond where Sharon's head is, see where I'm pointing? Do you see? That's the master bedroom in there, right? Yes. And there was blood all forming and sort of stained into the carpet of the master bedroom, right? Right. There was blood pooled into the carpet, and then there was the areas all around it where the blood had been smeared and transferred. You're familiar with footprints, aren't you? <coughs> yes. Footprints at a crime scene. Certainly. It, footprints can be very valuable at a crime scene, depending on the situation, right? Yes, and depending on the analysis of that individual footwear, yes. If somebody steps in blood and then continues to walk, you make a good blood prints. In other words, where you can really see the form of the shoe. Yes, they're referred to as patent prints, where you transfer blood from one object to the other. And it's fair to say that there are experts in law enforcement that can actually look at footprints like that and determine whether they actually match a particular pair of shoes? Yes. Okay. Depending on the situation. Depending on the shoe. Yes. Depending on the shoe. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I want to show you, first of all, what's being admitted is States Exhibit 86. Do you see that? I do. And by the way, before I move any further, that's a phone on top of... Ms. Randolph, Mrs. Randolph's uh, legs, right? Yes, it is. It still displays 911. It was still connected for quite a lengthy period of time. Well, before I move on, when you say it displays 911, it actually doesn't. It displays 911 doesn't it? If there's a four after that, I know it's when he connected to 911 and it continued on. We were able to trace it back to the time that he called. Right. So it was a 911 call, but the face t shows you the numbers, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And I'll come up with another uh, photo that's a little more clear on that. But you don't independently remember it saying 9114? No, I don't. Okay. You see the blood all, and I am going back to Exhibit 86. You see the blood in the, back, in the master bedroom, right? Yes, I do. It's pulled out onto the Berber carpet. There's absolutely no blood prints into that master, is there? We didn't find any blood prints, no. And when I say blood prints, I mean shoe prints of any type. Right, where someone had transferred it into the master bedroom, no. And in fact, in States Exhibit 106, we can see that there is a sort of a house carpet, for lack of a better term, now placed over the blood, right? Yes, we found those in each room. There was a carpet. And that's done so that law enforcement or first responders could actually come in without doing exactly what we've been talking about, leaving blood prints all throughout the house. Law enforcement, meaning us processing the scene, not first responders, because the body, uh, Sharon's body, has been removed from the scene at this point. So this is afterwards in documenting the scene. Now, in that same picture, we can see that there are drawers that have been removed from cabinets, right, right above. Yes, that's correct. And what appears to be a jewelry box? Yes. So it appears 
that Miss Randolph is laying there bleeding, leaving this big stain of blood, and yet we can clearly see these drawers removed and no blood prints towards them, right? That's correct. Page 108 is a picture of all those drawers, right? Yes. Okay. Somebody had gone through drawers in that house. Fair to say? Yes. In different rooms, right? Yes. You have had situations in your career, let's say with bank robberies, where a bank robber is interrupted in the middle of the bank robbery and there's some kind of shootout or something happens, something goes wrong during the bank robbery. Certainly. Burglars sometimes get caught because homeowners come home or they get caught red-handed running out a door and there's a police officer there. It happens, doesn't it? Yes, we have that. It's called, we refer to it as hot, a hot prowl. There were many officers at that scene, weren't there? Yes. I think I counted with Detective Mogg somewhere over 30. Seem out of place? That's fair to say on the, uh, looking at the CAD printout. And on the 911 call, we can hear Thomas Randolph, and at one point he's like, should I open the door? Did you hear that? Yes, I did. That was uh, right before he started. CPR at six minutes, 30 seconds. There was a place before CPR where Mr. Randolph says, should I go lock the door so the man can't, you know, the man can't get in because I can see him. Remember that? He wants to lock the garage door. Yes, that's uh, about three minutes into the call. And then at some point, he, he's doing CPR and he's saying, should I open the door? Do you remember that? And, and the fire department says, no, keep doing CPR. Do you remember this? Um, yes, I rem it was right after he completed the instruction for CPR and right before he started the compressions, he suggested he open the door. And the only, he's calling for help for his wife, right? He's calling 911 and asking what to do. He doesn't know what to do with his wife, right? Yes, he said that early on, about 45 seconds into the call. The only way that paramedics are going to get in that house is if he opens and unlocks the door to let them in, right? Yes, I mean, the paramedic said, tell Metro, tell your officers to get in any way they can. So what he's saying is, if I go unlock the door, maybe they can come in and help. Fair? Objection separation. It seems like if he can answer the question. Yes, That's what he's saying. I know right before he started with the uh, compressions and the, the paramedics telling him to focus on doing this for his wife, he said... I should, maybe I should go unlock the door or open the door. It's not unlock, but open the door. Okay. And the paramedic said, no, you need to focus on this. Yeah. Just a second. After Mr. Randolph leaves the residence, he's ordered out, isn't he, by police officers. When they see him, they're telling him, come out. Yes. Standard procedure. They don't. Certainly. They, it's a very dangerous situation. They want him to come out, right? Certainly. Mr. Randolph complained numerous times in these statements that it took so long for help to come to share. He says it took 30 minutes. They didn't come. Do you remember him saying these things? I remember him saying that, yes. Hey, at one point he says to you, did she die instantaneously? Do you remember that in the statement we just yes. heard? He said because he thought of her on the cold floor. Yes. The, that 911 tape is over 18 minutes long, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what it shows is it shows that paramedics never come. In that 18 minutes, nobody comes in there and helps Ms. Randolph, do they? I can't tell that from the actual call. Um, I know that in seven minutes and 30 seconds that Mr. Randolph leaves to open the door, and you can hear officers challenging him. Then you can hear the uh, maybe three, four, op four voices of officers clearing the residence. Okay, you can so hear paramedics stop. asking for Metro to give a code four so that they can go in, but I don't, you know, I don't hear paramedics. Okay, so before we listen to a portion of the 911, 
You said yesterday that you thought this crime scene had been preserved, right? Yes. Officers go in and they walk around what appear to be walking around the area of this hallway before that crime scene is secure at all. At all. In fact, they're sweeping the house, right? Yes, you can hear them clearing the house, yes. They're so conversing they with each other. I'm sorry to interrupt. So they would be walking around in the area where uh, potential uh, evidence could be? That's possible, yes. Okay. Could we hear that? While we're waiting for that to happen, you would agree with me. Have you listened to all 18 minutes? Yes, I have. After there's a sweeping of the house by, you said, maybe three officers, because you really can't tell. You're just hearing voices, right? About three or four voices, what I hear. One's a female, right? Yes, talking you, to Toby Maldonado. I can hear her use just, Toby's name. And you actually hear them identify there's a body there where they're realizing their body's in there. Yes. It's obviously probably a very kind of a scary situation, even for police officers. Certainly. And so we know that those officers are going around in this particular area uh, where there is evidence to be collected, correct? Potentially. And when you're sweeping a house, you're not worried about kicking a cartridge, are you? That's not true. You're, you're, uh, it's protocol to make every effort to preserve the crime scene even though you were performing that function. Officers know that. so. This isn't a SWAT entry where they're doing a dynamic entry and running through the house. This is a slow and methodical clearing of the, of the residents. They would see obvious evidence if that, was, if that was presented to them and they wouldn't disregard it. Detective O'Kelly, these people in that house are looking for potential suspects, shooters, something along those lines, right? Certainly. They're looking for somebody who could just turn around and shoot a police officer, right? Yes. So you imagine their focus is danger. We've got to make sure there's no danger, right? Their focus is everywhere as they're clearing the house, yes. And you would agree with me that uh, in doing that, in, in clearing that house, that one thing that they would want to do is make sure that there's nobody hiding in bedrooms, under beds, anything along those lines. I'd agree with that. And they want to make sure of that because they don't want to let some poor paramedic okay. come in. They don't, want, they don't want to let some poor paramedic come in, and then all of a sudden the paramedic's dealing with the hidden guy under the bed with a gun, right? Correct, or crime scene analysts or responding officers afterwards, yes. Okay. So if we could play that now and just hear, hear the portion of the officers in there.
Okay, detective, that appears to... I stopped it at 12 minutes. And after that, the jury can listen to it because it's being admitted. But it, we just hear sort of a silence after that for the rest of the 18 minutes. There. Yeah, yes, we do until 911 says uh, disconnect. You hear her say, I'm disconnecting right before it. Stop. The reason we can hear those officers sweeping that house is because... That phone is live. It's live to 911 on uh, Mrs. Randolph's body, right? That's correct. That's what we're hearing. We're hearing the officers and the speaker is that phone. Yes. Okay. And I guess another point that I want to make sure is fair is that for that whole 18 minutes, she doesn't get medical attention from paramedics, right? Yes, from beginning to end. There's, I don't hear paramedics. Uh, treating her. In fact, paramedics are delayed because of the dynamic situation in this scene. Yes, it's even in the report that that FD held off uh, for the code four. We can see that there were life saving efforts made upon Miller, right? On Mr. Miller, there were life saving efforts made on his body. I I don't know that I would. Qualified as life-saving efforts. Did you see the plastic on his wrist and the plastic right around his body? Right. Yes, That's I did. Paramedics at work. That's making a determination whether there's signs of life. Okay. So work was done by paramedics upon Mr. Miller, no matter what it was, right? Those sensors were placed on him. Yes, at some point. But none on Sharon Randall. Didn't see any on her. No. Mr. Randolph complained in those interviews because Mr. Randolph would have been right outside, right? He was taken outside and he's either sitting in a patrol car or sitting on the ground or something along those lines. I'm certain, yes. He would be the one who sees no one's coming in to help my wife, right? And that's what he says. You people didn't help my wife. Words to that effect. I don't know where he was to be able to see the entry and then the officers coming out, but yes, that, that's fair to say. It's fair to say he was really frustrated by that. He expressed it, didn't he? He did in interviews, yes. That's what I mean. In interviews, he expressed frustration that nobody would come to aid his wife. Certainly. In one of them, he said, well, I don't know if she's dead, right? Yes. 
He said it was horrible. He, he said, strike that. The body being turned over, was rolled over for him to do that. You remember the paramedic, tell, or excuse me, fire department saying, roll her over so that we can do CPR. Do yes, I do. And at some point you hear Mr. Randolph start screaming, Sharon, Sharon, right? Yes. While he's performing, while he's on the phone to uh, 911, he says, I can see the man out there, right? I can see who we now know to be Mr. Miller. He can see him. Yes. And he's worried about it because he's unsure if he's actually dead or something along those lines. Yes. But we know the door must be open to the garage because he's saying, I can see him, right? Correct. Mr. Randolph was asked what he thought of his wife. If you could describe her in one word. What, what did he say? She was effing wonderful. Yeah. And another time, even before he was asked that, he said she was wonderful. Yes, best thing that ever happened to me, he said. He, at one point, you know his father had had a stroke recently, right, because they were going back to Utah. Yes. And he said that they actually put his father, he, his father got some better medical care because of the advice of Sharon. Do you remember him saying that? I don't recall it specifically, but I'm, I'm sure that's true. We heard this statement yesterday. Do you want me to show it to you or would you accept it? No, I'll accept it, certainly. Going back to the Millers. There was a mask. You remember I talked to you about the gloves and now we, I want to talk about the masks. Police went to the Millers within hours of this incident to interview Vita and Billy Miller, right? I know they were shown the address, um, and I think the interview occurred later, but yes, it was, it was done pretty quickly. Mr. Randolph showed officers where they lived. Yes, he didn't remember the specific address, but he knew where it was, so he showed officers, yes. So he, he cooperated and showed officers, this is where that guy lives. Yes. And when Vita and Billy Miller were interviewed. Both Vita and Billy stated that they were missing a mask, a ski mask. Yes. And in fact, Vita said that she hadn't seen the mask since December of 2007. Do you remember that? Yes. When did Mr. Miller move in to Vita and Miller and Billy Miller's home? In December of 2007. So once. Michael Miller shows up on the scene at the Billy and Vita Miller's home. Vita doesn't see that mask again, does she? She said she didn't. She said it's the same month, yes. And one thing that was told to police about that mask is it had a big mouthpiece. Isn't that right? Yes. You've seen the mask in this case, haven't you? Yes. And it's got some kind of sewing of the mouthpiece, like almost looks like a fishing line all the way. Yes. Would you agree with that? I do. Is there somebody closed up the mouthpiece? Right. Did you obtain, for purposes of Ware's DNA, Billy Miller's DNA, to compare yes. to see if it, it was on that mask? Billy Miller? Yes, sir. No. Because that could have told us if, in fact, that was Billy Miller's mask that had gone missing. It's possible. As a result of Vita and Billy Miller saying that this mask was missing, the house was searched, wasn't it, for a mask? Yes, officers checked for the mask. And no mask was located? No. No gloves of any relevance were located? No. And that's because... The only place you're going to locate that mask is about two feet from Mr. Miller's, Michael Miller's head. Isn't that right? That's where we found the ski mask, laying face up. And in fact, in police statements, Mr. Randolph says that that mask was laying right by Michael Miller. Do you remember that? He said it was laying by him. I remember him saying that, yes. 
And on multiple occasions, Thomas Randolph tells you and other detectives that when he bumped in to Michael, something happened to the mask. It pushed up. Do you remember that? Yes, he told me during the walkthrough that when he bumped in, he bumped up and he could see his chin. And he had said that in the first statement to Detective Mom, that something had happened with this mask where maybe he couldn't quite see, right? I remember that in the second interview. I don't remember the couldn't quite see part in the first interview. He says it. He talks about this mask being pushed up multiple times, doesn't he? Yeah, I remember in the second interview he talked about it possibly being rolled up. Okay. Would you agree that if a mask is obstructing your view, one way to get rid of that problem is take that mask off, right? I would agree with that. You are aware of the DNA results in this case, aren't you, as the lead detective? Yes. Thomas Randolph is excluded from that mask, the DNA. Yes. Thomas Randolph told the authorities that he went and looked in these bags to see, bags next to Mr. Miller, to see if he could locate the gun, right? Yes. And this is the 22 caliber we're talking about, right? It's the gun that Michael Miller had, yes. So Mr. Randolph says he touches these bags looking for the, the gun, right? Yes. And at some point... He says, Thomas Randolph, that he takes this 22 Smith & Wesson six-shot revolver and he throws it away from Mr. Miller into one of the bedrooms. He throws it actually into Northeast bedroom, which is depicted as number 14, right? Yes, he said he was aiming for the trash can. So I just want to make sure this is clear. The 38 caliber Smith & Wesson six-shot revolver is the murder weapon. Yes. And again, just so we get this down, there are two revolvers in this case. One a 38, it's got a wood grip, Smith & Wesson, kind of looks like the 22. Would you agree with me? Yeah, they're about the same size. Same Please. size, capering, yes. But one fires 22s and one fires 38s. Yes. And we know the 38 is found near the body of Sharon Randolph, right? 50. Yes, in the drum room against the south wall. It, just for purposes of this diagram, don't mean to pick, but it says East Bedroom, just for purposes of the diagram. I know what you're saying. Certainly. Okay. 15, the 38 is the murder weapon, right? Yes. Mr. Randolph doesn't say he takes... I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 90. That's the 38, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you see there's a mark right on the wall. I don't know if it comes out very well. Right above it, you see there's like scratch marks. Too. I can see it. I'm familiar with it. It oh. starts, you can see it from here. It comes all the way down to here. Almost like the gun had... Actually, I think it goes further up. It might be here, and then all the way arcs down. Like the gun, had, some portion of the gun had hit the wall and sort of scraped down. Something along those lines. That it scraped against the wall, possibly. Just that it's in the area of where the grip is. It just seemed odd. I did document it. You found in your experience in law enforcement that oftentimes people will want to dispose of a murder weapon, right? Yes. One way to dispose of a murder weapon if it doesn't belong to you and it's not your house is just to leave it there, right? It doesn't really dispose of it. It's there at the scene. It, it doesn't connect the murderer to it by leaving it at the scene. Well, and again, that depends on whether or not you're leaving DNA or if there's fingerprints on the casings inside the cylinder. There's, there's other ways to connect a person to a weapon. Was that gun tested for DNA or fingerprints? Yes. And Mr. Miller, we know, had gloves on, right? Yes, he did. So Mr. Miller would know I'm not really leaving fingerprints because I've got gloves on. Certainly. Not leaving DNA because i got gloves on. Yes. I leave, throw this gun down and don't take it with me. It's, it can't be really caught at my house, right? No, not unless he touched it without gloves at some point. And I'm showing you what has been admitted as States 128. This is a picture.
picture, not a very clear one, but a picture of the suitcase that had the 22 caliber on it, right? Yes, so you can see the trigger guard and the barrel. And I don't, let's see if I can put that over there. And that was, that's at 14, right? That's... It's in the northeast bedroom, the office. Yep, number right 14. There. Okay. Thomas Randolph grabs the non-murder weapon that he says is by Miller's body, and he throws it, and he says he's trying to throw it in the trash can. He's aiming for the trash can, yes. That is not the murder weapon. The 22 that he's taken from Mr. Miller is not the murder weapon, is it? No, it is not. The 38 is? Yes. There was a safe in the house. Yes, there was in the master bedroom closet, the sentry safe. It was a, a little safe. Yes, yeah, small one. Could you show us just with your hands approximately how big I'd it is? I'd say it's maybe a foot and a half wide. It was kind of a drawer type safe where once you unlock it, it disconnects from the, uh, the fixed locking mechanism and pulls out. And then there was a top that lifted up on it. Well, tell us more about the big safe. Not that one. I don't want to know about that one. I want to know about the big safe. Where was that? We didn't locate another safe. There was another safe in that house, wasn't there? So I've been told there was another safe in the house. In fact, there was a... Do you remember there's some closet doors, and they are not removed, but sort of off the tracks. Do you remember that? I believe the inside door in the drum room was off the tracks, yes, and leaning into the closet. What was in that closet? Um, various items of clothing and just what you'd expect to be found in a closet. I am going to show you what has been marked for identification as proposed exhibit R. May I approach up? Yes. Now, detective, I'm going to show you this picture. There was a point in time there was a point in time where you were back in the house and there were pictures being taken, right? Do you remember you went back in the house with Colleen, uh, Sharon's daughter, and there were pictures being taken? I don't remember pictures being taken, but we were back at the house a couple of times. It, we just mentioned the one on July 2nd we were there, and then uh, September 11th was there, there as well. Do you know where she's standing? It appears as though she's standing on the east wall in that room, the drum room. And what is she standing in front of? In front of a brown safe. It appears to be a brown safe. A large brown safe. Yes. Okay. I move for submission. No objection to R. No objection. Yeah, publish. R, we admit it, yes. Okay, so I want to show you State's Exhibit 99. This purports to be the drum room, right? Yes, that's the uh, interior door on the closet. As I mentioned, it's off track. So that door is off track. Okay, I, Detective O'Kelly, I am showing you what has been admitted as State's Exhibit 99, and we were talking about the drum room, okay? 
And the, you, you mentioned that the doors seem to be off track, right? One of them does. And do you see, I want you to concentrate on the bot in the closet, on the bottom by the clothes. Do you see a brown object? Yes, I do. Metal or something along those lines. Yes, it appears to be the safe that you showed me in the previous picture. Okay, because now I'm going to show you the, what we have just admitted as... Proposed exhibit R. And you can see Colleen standing by a large safe. Yes. When I say large, to be fair, about 24 inches high? I'd say it's a two foot cube. Two foot cube? Okay. Is it fair to say, Detective, that there are no pictures of that safe? Taken by crime scene analysts? Except for the one that you just showed me, and we don't see it discernible as a, as a safe. You realize that's not a crime scene analyst who took that photograph. Somebody else is taking that photograph. He's not talking about that photograph. He's talking about the other photograph. The one you can see a portion of it. Okay. It was taken that night. Okay. So, so the only one, in other words, you, crime scene analysts don't take a picture of that safe like we see it here. Showing you that it's a safe, no. Was it open on... May 8th slash May 9th. Was the safe open? Yes, sir. I have no idea. I mean, the door's up against it. I can't, I can't expect that that front door of the safe is open. W was there lots of valuables taken out? I have no idea. So fair to say that in this investigation and preservation of the scene, there's a large safe that's not discussed in any report, fair. That's fair. No pictures taken, fair. Other than that one where you can see a portion of it, yes. It's not discernible as a safe, I agree with you. I'm going to show you another picture. Uh, it's going to be proposed exhibit T is in Tom. May I approach? Yes. Detective O'Kelly, do you see what appears, do you recognize that person in the picture? I do. It looks like Colleen with one of her children. And is this the same drum room? It is. Okay. You recognize that? I do. Move for submission. Any objection to tea? Uh, no. No objection. And I can publish. Yes. That is <coughs> Colleen and one of her children in that drum room where we can see the Closet door, right? One closet door. It looks like the outer one's not even there. It's clearly off its rails. Yes. We have them in my house. They're very annoying. There is a picture, maybe you can remember and it shows yellow tape out in front of the house. Do you remember this? Yes. This is something you've probably seen more times than you can count in your life. Certainly. It means some, I presume, patrol officer is, he or she is taping off the area, telling people, stay back, get back, don't come in here. Yes. And one of the reasons you do that is for preservation of a crime scene. Yes. You dealt with homicides a long time, right? Yes. You saw some... Very startling things in your career. Right? Certainly. Bodies and things like children's bodies, right? Certainly. And one of the things you don't want is you guys are trying to work in there, maybe life-saving procedures or, you know, trying to preserve the scene, take pictures of the scene. You don't want some incredibly anxious mother who's like, where's my child and go, going in, right? No, you don't want had that happen, yes. Because it's highly disturbing to police doing their work, right? more preservation of the scene. It's understandable that you would have that reaction. And it's understandable because human beings that have lost loved ones, this is very tragic, right? Certainly. And the concept that you could, the concept that you could see
Your Honor, I would move for the admission of T and R have already been admitted, but I would move for the admissions of Yes. No, Your Honor, and there is a stipulation also on the record that all of these photographs that have just been shown were taken on July 2nd, 2008. That's correct. So, S and U will be admitted. There is a stipulation between the parties that the Hanks exhibit R, S, T, and U was taken on July 2nd of 2008. Okay. So, July 2nd of 2008 is seven weeks, a lengthy period of time after the incident. Fair? It is. So, I'm going to go back to States Exhibit 1. You see, that's the crime scene tape I'm talking about, right? You see that there? It tells people, stay away, keep back, let's preserve this crime scene, right? Right. They've established an inner and outer perimeter as well. Okay. And just this that I'm showing you, the exhibit I'm showing you, is taken on the night in question. Maybe in the early morning hours of the 9th, but it's the 8th into the 9th. Fair? Yes, I can see Lieutenant Robert standing right there. And we can see you too, can't we? Is it me? Isn't that you back by the Pontiac, sir? I was heavier back then. Better looking. That's me. That's you, isn't it? You're right back there where one of those cartridges is found, right? Yes. And the questioning I wanted to do is make sure that you were talking about, you don't want mothers coming in there because it could be really upsetting, besides the preservation of the crime scene, right? Certainly. You don't want family members, strike that. I'm going to show you and publish, exhibit you. Do you see the arrows up on the wall? Yes, I do. And the ruler tape. This was put up a long period of time beforehand by detective, or excuse me, by Mr. Randy McPhail, crime scene analyst? On May 15th, directly after the walkthrough. And what it depicts is it depicts, those arrows depict blood and brain matter. Fair? Blood and tissue and, yes, cerebral spinal fluid, yes. And the bullet impact. And what you appear to be doing is explaining that to Colleen. Fair? Yes. What did, who, is Colleen holding somebody? I can't tell on that photograph. Okay. If I showed you, if I show you exhibit S. Objection relevant? Can we confront on this before we start? Yes.
Yes or no, detective? Are you in that photo S explaining and when I say S and in you explaining the crime scene to Colleen and her child? Yes or no? No. I'm explaining what happened to her mom. On the night in question, the 8th into the night, you told us that Thomas Randolph had talked to law enforcement at the scene so that they could get sort of a better understanding of what they were dealing with inside that house, right? Yes. He did it voluntarily. Yes. He then accompanied Detective Mogg and Detective Hardy down to the police station, Homicide, and he gave a lengthy interview, right? Yes, he did. He, he cooperated and answered the detective's questions. Yes. He then was involved in a walkthrough with you, right? Yes, one week later. Okay. Several other officers there. Detective uh, Mogg, Sergeant Detective Alvey. Wilson, yes. Sergeant Alvey and, and uh, videographer. Okay. And he answered the questions that you asked him, didn't he? Yes, he did. At the beginning of the video, did you see that he, his eyes appeared a little droopy, a little, did you notice that? I noticed that when Don Bell put the camera up on his shoulder that Mr. Randolph exhibited those traits, yes. But he still answers all your questions to the best of your, his ability, he gets down on the floor, he, right? Yes, he does. At one point you even try, you tell him to get down and show you how he was trying to help Sharon. No, actually, he was doing that on his own. Nobody told him to do that. You were asking him to reenact the scene, well, right? We're, we're going asking through him the scene. to reenact the scene, right? No one asked him to get on the ground. He did it himself, yes. You asked him to come in there and reenact the scene, didn't you? Yes, we're going through the scene. And he got down on the ground to show you how he had done it. Yes, he did. He then, DNA was taken from him, wasn't it? At that time? At some point, DNA yes. was taken from And when you take DNA from somebody, I, I've actually seen you do it on video before. You, you, you pull out gloves and you pull out a packet and take what looks like a, a long... Q-tip. Yeah. Yes. You rub it in the mouth. Finish. They rub it themselves. There's, it's a kit. The gloves are in there. All the paperwork's in there. The Q-tips are in there. The boxes they go in are in there. But you hand them uh, the, the Q-tip and then they go on both sides of their cheek. Sometimes you get warrants to get people's DNA, don't you? Sometimes, yes. But in this case, Mr. Randolph said, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, uh. Voluntary consent. Yeah, he voluntarily consented. And he voluntarily consented on May 8th into the 9th to let officers search the house as well. Yes, he did. And then he gives another interview that we've just gone over, and that is on, for accuracy, the 3rd of June. Correct. And he voluntarily proceeds to the police station and answers your questions. Yes, he did. Just so I don't forget, there's a mention of a Brady being shot. Do you remember that, a discussion of a Brady? Do you know who Jim Brady is? Yes, I do. He was the man who was badly injured when With Reagan. Reagan. Yes. And do you remember when there's a, a discussion about Brady being shot? That's what it's in reference to. Yes, I think he was referring to the Brady Bill. Yes. Okay. Mr. Randolph told you that Michael Miller had made these statements. That we, we heard that in the interview about how he'd been involved. Michael had been involved in criminal activity. Do you remember that? I don't remember specifically which criminal activity you're talking about. Do you remember that Randolph said, oh, I didn't believe him, but he was talking about all these things he did. Oh, like a robbery, there was something? Yes. Did, yes. yes. I remember him talking about that. He didn't believe him, did he? He said, nah, I didn't, I didn't take that seriously. That's what it sounded like. I thought he was just making up his little story, right? That's what it sounded like, yes. Okay. So 
And then he continues to tell you how he trusted this murderer, Michael Miller, right? He told you he yes. trusted him he a told, number of times. He told us multiple times that he trusted him, yes. He told you that Michael Miller knew that Sharon and Thomas were going out to eat at the charcoal room and then a movie, right? Correct. Tommy tells you they didn't go to the movie, right? Yes. And then they went back home to, uh, for lack of a better word, have sexual relations. Yes. Okay. He just says it in a bad way, doesn't he? Right? Yes. You knew that Mr. Miller, or you being told, had a key to that house. Yes, that he had it at some point, and, but had returned it. There was no sign of forced entry, was there? No, there wasn't. But there's a pair of keys. There's a pair of keys in a lock to the shed. Do you know what I'm talking about? A pair of keys? Do you remember some keys in a, that are left in a... Yes. I remember the photograph of those keys, yes. What was that leading to? What was, if I went in that door and walked in, what would I be going into? I'm not sure. I'd have to see the reference shot for that particular uh, set of keys. What? Whose keys were those? I don't know. If I wanted to show them to the jury, did you impound them? Were those keys impounded? No, we only impounded the keys that were inside the black fabric bag. There was, you know, on a set of keys, sometimes they have, I do, like you have your shopping little card. You know yes. On these keys, it appeared that there were things like that, shopping. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Who, whose name was on? I don't know. Which keys you're talking about? The keys that we're talking about that are in that lock. I'm not sure. So it's fair to say there is a set of keys out there that was not impounded, right, at that house. It was in a lock. Yes. Wasn't impounded. No. Wasn't tested for any forensics. No. We didn't record who is on those cards at all. No. We don't know whose they are. No. I am showing you what has been admitted as state 15. Do you see those keys in the door? Yes, I do. That's the reference shot I, I was referring to. And so fair to say, we just, we know it's a pair of keys, set of keys, we just don't know anything about it. Right? I mean, that's... I don't know whose keys they are, no. You want to give him the parameters when you've told me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. We are going to take our lunch recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, listen to news or media accounts or commentary about this case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. And you must not form or express any opinion regarding this case until it's finally submitted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 1225. We will be in recess until 140. All rise right for the jury.
seated. Round of the jury call, President of the Council. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Orr, whenever you're ready. Detective O'Kelly, I just have about 10 or 11 areas to go through with you, okay? No problem, Counselor. Okay, so we left off and we were talking about a uh, key to key to keys that were left in a door and this is state's exhibit 16 is that the keys we're talking about that's a close-up of the keys you showed me earlier yes okay and fair to say those were not impounded no they were not now After you left that early morning on May 9th, that scene was not kept.
what has been admitted as 168. That's the jewelry we were discussing, right? Yes, the jewelry was laid out, that was in the bag was laid out and uh, photogra photographed and documented for us. And you have, remember I was asking you about hoop earrings and gold, and you said, well, gold metal looking things, right? There's a lot of gold metal looking things there. We're always going to say yellow metal in our report. We can't value those things or determine right there on the spot that it's gold. But it could be valued, right? I mean, it could Certainly. Be okay. Absolutely. And I want to show you what's being admitted as States 167. Do you see those four what appear to be gold and silver coins? Oh, yes, I see what you're talking about there. You're trying to show me the bag. Yes, I can see those. And they're in plastic? Yes. And you don't know what they're worth or if it's solid gold or? I have no idea. Just so we're clear, in your officer's report, you describe that this is mostly cosmetic jewelry. Did you make that statement? Yes, it's inaccurate. It's costume. You mean that's what you meant? Not that that's costume jewelry? No, oh, I, meant, I meant that it's mostly costume jewelry. Yes. That's your opinion? It, is, it was my opinion. And just so I can go, go back to the shoes for a second, states... Exhibit 52, do you see that Reebok right off, Reebok shoe right behind uh, Mr. Miller's leg? Yes, it appears as though his uh, left leg is actually on top of it. And you see that those items I'm pointing to, that's what we were talking about with uh, paramedics coming in and checking for pulse. Right, that's the back side. Um, they actually stick the sensors on and then that's what they peeled off laying there. We determined that there was a cell phone at the residence that didn't belong to him. By a person named Corey Thompson? That sounds familiar, yes. So you found a, fo you found a phone in Mr. Miller's room, but it was registered to a Corey Thompson? Yes. And without telling me what Corey Thompson said, you talked to him. Yes, we did. And what you can tell us without saying anything he said is there was no connection between Corey Thompson and Michael Miller. Not that he knew, no. Except for the fact that his cell phone, Corey Thompson's cell phone, was found in Mr. Miller's possession. Yes. The life insurance that we've talked about this was taken out by Sharon Randolph, correct? It's signed, and the documents are signed by Sharon Randolph, so yes, I would assume she's taken out the policy. And in order to get life insurance, you need to go through a medical, get blood, those kind of things, right? I've heard advertisements where you don't have to, but yes, most of the time you do. You have no reason to believe that didn't occur in this case? I have no reason not to believe that. Okay, and so this is life insurance that Sharon Randolph has gotten so that she could protect her loved ones, right? I would assume that. And I noticed that the date on this insurance, a lot of it was 2006, right? Yes. A couple of years before. Yes. It wasn't two months before the incident or a month before the incident, right? Correct. And at least one of them that we don't have the policy, as you point out, but she was actually having her wages, money was taken out of her wages to pay for the premium. Yes. You found strong opioid medicine connected to Mr. Randolph, his prescriptions. Do you remember that? Yes. And you had a discussion with Mr. Randolph about the, how potentially strong they were. Do you remember that? Yes. These are strong medications, as, as you're aware, right? Correct. <laughs> they have effects upon people, don't they? Certainly.
when you went and said, you told the jury words to the effect of, I was uh, there to keep the peace while Colleen moved into the house that was being, had been shared by Sharon and Tommy. Do you, were you in a uniform? No, and, and she was there to have the locks changed that the agreement had occurred between the attorneys. Mr. Randolph had numerous belongings in that house, didn't he? I'm certain. Including he had a Harley Davidson in the shed, didn't he? Yes. And he told you that he was going to go in and he was going to get his belongings, right? Yes. And you told him that's not happening, right? I did. You had absolutely no court order. You had absolute. What authority? Strike that. When you did that, he has a right to his belongings, does he not, sir? At that point, nothing was to leave the house because that's what had been agreed upon between the attorneys on both sides. There was no court order that he couldn't take his belongings. I nothing. didn't see a court order, no. So you were just deciding as a homicide detective that that man wouldn't be allowed, Mr. Randolph wouldn't be allowed to take his belongings that day when he showed up, right? On that day, no. After that, Mr. Randolph makes claims, right? I saw that he made claims for insurance, <coughs> right? Do you remember? that he, It's not right away, a month, two later, correct? Yes. There was a conversation about Thomas Randolph on the 911 call saying Mike had been ripping him off. Do you remember that? Yes, very early on in the call. And do you recall that he was questioned, Mr. Randolph was questioned about that the very, you know, within hours about what he meant by that? Do you recall that? Yes. And do you recall that, and I am looking at the 5 9 statement, page 60, counsel. Do you recall that Thomas Randolph clarified and said, what I was saying on the 911, what I was probably referring to is he was ripping me off the act right then. He was ripping us off right then. Do you remember that? Yes. Fire extinguisher. You have talked about this fire extinguisher, have you not? Yes. Okay. And there was a statement that the fire extinguisher was on top of the refrigerator, right? Do you remember this? That Mr. Randolph said that the fire extinguisher fell off of the refrigerator. And you told the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you looked up there and there was no dust mark or something that you thought should be there. Fair? Correct. Could we look at a picture of that? Of the lack of the dust ring? No, I didn't have The top have of that refrigerator looking down so we could see what you were saying? No. So you found this important, yet we don't have a single picture of it, do we? No. What was below that refrigerator, sir? A carpet. Semicircle carpet. And... You looked at the top of the refrigerator, things were sort of disheveled. Do you recall that? There was a uh, uh, oscillating fan that was on top of a uh, crock pot. That, was, that would be out of place. And Mr. Miller was laying right against that fridge, right? Yes, his, uh, his left shoulder was against the fridge. And in fact, the fridge was dented, was it not? Dented. Yes, it was dented. Did you see a dent in the fridge right by Mr. Miller's body? No, I didn't see a dent. Did you look for one? Did I look for a dent? Yes, sir. Not in particular. Because if there's a dent in the fridge, that means something hit it pretty hard, right? To dent a fridge. Certainly. And you didn't notice it? No, I didn't see a, a dent. I didn't make note of a dent.
And there was, you noted a mark on the bottom or on some part of that fire extinguisher showing that there was sort of like a dent or uh, some type of defect. Yes, on the edge of the bottom edge of the fire extinguisher, there was a flat portion where it appeared to have struck possibly a concrete surface. A and you pointed out to the jury that there was a screw to the left. If I'm looking at the refrigerator to the left, there was a single screw. <coughs> yes. After Sharon's death, you can see with records, banking records, that uh, Thomas Randolph was having to take money out of credit cards or use credit cards. He's trying to survive, right? You see that? I don't know the purposes for him with his finances. I have no idea. Did you look for a bike? Yes, we did. In the area? Yes, we did. Because you wanted to know how Michael Miller could have gotten away? Because we wanted to know how he got there in the first place, based on Mr. Randolph said that he that uh, Mike would often come over to the house on a bicycle, so we looked to see if there was a bike anywhere. But you didn't find one, did you? No, we didn't. So you were concerned about who could be a getaway driver, right? I didn't. I didn't think about a getaway driver. No. no. What was Mr. Miller's girlfriend's vehicle type? I don't know. During the interview that we heard just now, you saw Thomas Randolph answer his phone and talk with Coley. <coughs> I heard him say that he would call. He said Colleen and he would call her back. You learned that Sharon Randolph had provided stuff, things, to Michael Miller, right? Yes. She was kind to him, right? Yes. Lastly, Thomas Randolph said that Sharon's problem, if she had one, was that she gambled too much, right? He said that to you. Yes. He said that his problem is he's cocky. Do you remember him, Thomas Randolph, saying about his own problem, that he's cocky? you remember him saying that? I remember him saying too cocky. Too cocky. Yes. And he said that Michael Miller didn't have a steady job. That was his problem, right? Yes. Of course it was. That includes us. I proceed? Yes. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right. Well, that, that's, a, that's a lot of things to cover. I'm going to try to do the best I can to track it, okay, detective? Um, at the very beginning of cross-examination, there were some questions about Bartlett, remember, and the 911 call and the timing. Do you remember all that? I do. Okay. Um, there was some talk about collecting, you know, reviewing the phone records and seeing Bartlett uh, called at 8, at 8.33. Do you remember that? 8.33.36. Okay. Um, how long was the length of that phone call? About four and a half minutes. 270, 270 seconds. seconds. So exactly four minutes and 30 seconds, correct? Yes. If you add four minutes to um, 
833. What do you, what do you get? About 838. Okay. So if you add the four and a half minutes, you get to 838, right? Yes. That is not 845, correct? It is not. Seven minutes shy. But that's when the 911 call happens, right? Correct. Right. Speaking of records, you, you also collected um, phone records, Vonage records for the defendant, correct? Yes, we did. Okay. And, and they were in included in, in records you submitted to our office, correct? That's correct. Okay. Also, in relation to um, kind of the gun, there were some questions about uh, the timing of these gunshots. Um, the defendant said he didn't hear those shots because he was hard of hearing, correct? Yes, and he had the radio turned up loud inside the Hyundai Tucson as he was parking. Did you ever, did you or someone else ever take a step inside that vehicle to hear the sound in the car? Detective Mogg did. Okay, was it abnormally loud? No, he noted that the radio was being played at normal volume or reasonable volume. Okay, so there were questions on cross-examination um, about uh, a gunshot wound, a penetrating gunshot wound. Do you remember that? I do. Okay, so you, you weren't here for the testimony of Dr. Gavin, correct? No, I was not. So you didn't hear necessarily the manner in which he ordered or numbered the shots, correct? No, I wasn't. And, and when I say order, I just mean like the order of the shots as she examined them, not necessarily the sequence, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, she examined the wounds, not the shots, Mr. Hammond. You're, you're right, so my apologies. Um, publishing Exhibit 330. <laughs> probably could just turn off the light, couldn't yeah. I? I knew how to turn off the light. Mm -hmm. Is it this one? Oh, look at that. Thanks, great. All right. So, looking at gunshot wound number four, do you see that there? I do. Um, it's your understanding that one came through on the left side of his body, right? On the left side of his chest. And, it, and it's a penetrating one, meaning it didn't exit out of his body, correct? No, it was recovered on his uh, right back above the hip. Okay, so that one is on the left side. Correct. Right? And with respect to this shot here, uh, the one that you've seen probably, you're probably there when the trajectory rods were being done, remember yes. that? That one also is on the left-hand side. Left-hand side, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, this second shot, um, your understanding is that second shot at the head also starts at the left, the left-hand side, right? Up near the top of the head. It does. And it goes downwards, is that right? Correct. But it's also on the left. Yes. And then the fifth one, the one that enters the back of the elbow, that's also on the left-hand side of the body, right? Yes, it's the back of the elbow and it exits the forearm. So four of those are on the left. And then the only other shot that's actually not on the left side is, is at least marked as number three. You remember one that enters kind of uh, near the left side near the abdomen and then goes straight up and then kind of comes out near, I don't know, near the collarbone-ish area here, right on the right side. Exactly. That's the one I thought Mr. Orm was talking about when we were discussing it, is that shot. Okay. So just to be clear, four of them from the left side, one of them in the middle, but that's number three, correct? Correct. There were questions about soot stippling. Do you remember that? I do. And there was talk about clothing and skin and whether stippling shows up on skin versus clothing, things of that nature. Do you remember that? Correct. Okay. Um, you had said you wouldn't expect there to be stippling present on his abdomen. Why was that again? Because he had a thick uh, hooded sweatshirt on and then he had that uh, white Henley t-shirt on the underneath which was also thicker. And essentially the hot powder, if it touches your exposed skin, that's what leaves the burn. It's actually stippling is uh, the high velocity unburnt powder that's actually leaving little small uh, contusions. It's leaving marks on there because it hits the skin so hard. Okay. But as far as you wouldn't expect it on clothing in terms of stippling because you're just going to see what defects in the, in the clothing? Possibly. Let me ask you about gunshot residue. Is that a specific type of test or just more of a generalized test? It's a generalized test. We'll take a swipe and then you can either have it tested or not. And, and what is that supposed to catch if you're just in an area when 
gun residues kind of floating in the air? Absolutely. If you're in an enclosed car and someone fires a gun, you're going to have gunshot residue on you. And, and just to be clear, I mean, you were there at the walkthrough, right? Yes. And the defendant says he shoots him when he's squared up on him in that hallway, right? Yes. And during interview number one, I think he even indicates he was three feet or less from him. Yes. There were questions on cross-examination. Do you remember when he said, you know, the defendant, you know, he said he shot him while in the garage or nearby the garage. Do you, do you remember those questions on cross? I do. Okay. When you went to the walkthrough, how is the defendant gesturing he shot him while kind of in the garage? What, where is he aiming at that point during the walkthrough? What do you remember the defendant saying? At Michael Miller's head in response to the loud noise that scared him. Okay. So... Does the defendant indicate that when he is shooting him, Miller is on the ground? Yes. And he also talks about, oh, I got scared because of the fire extinguisher, right? It caused him to go bam, bam, right? Because of the loud noise that scared him. And, and just to be clear, where, what direction is Miller's feet pointing? His feet are to the west, and his head is to, to the east in the garage. So his head is near the, the car, right? Yes. Like, the, like the, the front hood of the car, and his feet are going back towards Sharon, right? And his feet are going back towards where the water heater is on the west side of the garage. Okay. And where is Mr. Randolph saying he is positioned? Where is he? What body part of Mr. Miller is he closest to? He'd be closest to his head. Well, he, the midsection. Well, does he, doesn't he say he's standing by his feet, by the, the, by the lip of the door? When he, doesn't he lean down and, and do this? He stands in the threshold and fires. He, he said, bam, bam, each time. Okay, so Mr. Miller's feet, based on that walkthrough, are closest to Mr. Randolph. It'd be... And he's leaning down and he's shooting towards his head. Yeah, it'd be just based on where he is in relation to the door frame. He could be, uh, say, towards the back of his legs. Okay. <laughs> And this second gunshot starts at the top of his head. Yes. Which is closest to the front fender of the car. Yes. His head is opposite of his feet. Yes. And Mr. Randolph is standing by his feet. Yes. And that bullet is traveling back towards his feet. Yes. This one, number one, enters the left side of his head. Yes. And it's going across his head. Yes, across and, and upward. And upward. But Mr. Randolph says he's standing essentially right at the lip of the hallway into the garage. Right at the threshold, yes. But that gunshot is going from left to right. Yes. But he's back behind the feet. Yes. And that is the area in the garage that he says he shoots this man. Yes. You were questioned about the fact you didn't interview a Mr. Hogue, is that correct? Yes. However, you did speak to 60 witnesses, correct? Approximately, yes. You subpoenaed bank records? Yes. You subpoenaed phone records? Yes. You subpoenaed gang re gaming records? Yes. You collected surveillance video? Yes, we did. From a gas station and a casino? Yes. You also interviewed the defendant twice and did a walkthrough with him? Yes. There were questions on cross-examination about the garage light. Do you remember that on cross-examination? Yes. Do you remember counsel talking about how uh, Mr. the defendant said that Mr. Miller um, pushed the garage door? Do you remember that? That he thought he was going for the garage door opener. And that was kind of my point. The defendant never said that Miller successfully opened the garage door, only that he was trying to. Yes. Because in order to turn that light on, you'd actually have to make contact with the garage. Yes, you do. It's like a doorbell switch, and he had it mounted on the inside of the hallway. And the defendant was interviewed not once, not twice, essentially three times, if you include the walkthrough. Yes. At no point does he say that Mr. Miller successfully touched the garage door, causing it to open. No.
And then there were questions about the fact that the defendant said that when he kind of re-entered the house going into the hall, that he touched that light a second time after the garage door closed. Do you remember being asked that on cross? Yes, when he first sees Sharon in the hallway. And, and, and that's said during the walkthrough, isn't that right? Yes. And, and does he say that Objection right? Leading. Okay. When does the defendant say he touched the garage light? Right after he came in and saw Sharon laying there, he thought to maybe go get a neighbor, and he pushed the, the he, he opened it and then closed it right then. At this point in time in which he's describing this, has he encountered Mr. Miller at all? No, it's right when he spotted Sharon on the so floor. So right when he walks in? Yes. So seconds after closing the garage door, he's now touching it a second time? Yes. So a matter of seconds? Yes. There were questions on cross-examination. Do you recall defense counsel asked you, and the defendant said he trusted Mr. Miller. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, did he also refer to him as a bum? Yes, he said it several times. Did he also say this guy couldn't work to save his life? Yes. Yet he continued to hire him? Yes. And continued to pay him? I presume so, yes. For months? Yes. There were questions about um, the defendant saying he didn't think Mr. Miller had a drug problem. Do you remember that? In an interview, he says, I don't, I don't think he had a drug problem. He, he drank. No, yeah, initially, I think he was confused about the question because he initially said, yes, he had a problem with drugs. And then he said he was talking about his drinking. Okay, because he, he made the comment of he's black and he's buying a 40. Right. And then clarifies, I don't think he had a drug problem. Yes. Okay. Um, you weren't you you said you didn't review the talks is that right i don't have i never received it okay. i checked the file even recently and I so have so it. if if the medical examiner testified that it was only a metabolite of cocaine you wouldn't have any reason objection here say it's no different than how they've phrased this with respect to the medical examiner last time okay so since you weren't here for the medical examiner if, if the medical examiner said it was only a metabolite of cocaine, you wouldn't have any reason to disagree with that? No. Do you remember there were questions about uh, the cell phone that's sitting on Sharon's dead body? The house phone, yes. Uh, the, the house phone, I'm sorry. The house phone that's sitting on her dead body. Remember that? Phone. Yes. And there was this conversation about 9114. Remember that? Yes. Okay. Just, just to be clear, um, the defendant said he successfully calls 911, right? Yes. His discussion about being unsuccessful reaching 911 is prior to the last successful 911 call, right? Yes. And when the phone, the picture of her on her body is being taken, it's after all this is over, right? Yes, and it stays connected all the way after. So, so that's the condition of the phone after the last successful 911 call. Yes. I mean, Detective, in, in your years of experience using handheld telephones, have you ever nudged just a phone, a button while on the phone before? Certainly. It didn't turn off your phone, right? I've, I've act, actually activated buttons with my face sometimes, yes. Okay. And, and, and we've heard the 911 call, right? Yes. And it goes for 18 minutes, right? Yes. Until finally someone from law turns it off. Right. Do you remember some questions about, it appears as when you looked at the scene, it appeared as if someone went through the drawers. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, and, I, and I think there was a, a question that was posed to you, like you've had some experience of people getting caught red-handed in the middle of kind of committing a burglary or something like that. Yes. J just, just to be clear, uh, when you review the scene in those bags, it's lots of jewelry, right? Yes, there was. Okay. The defendant told you and your fellow officers that Miller was aware that, that, that he and Sharon were gone the, the week before up in Utah, right? Yes, they'd just gotten back. And did the defendant also say in his interviews that Miller knew that the night or the day after May 8th, they were leaving town to go back up to Utah? Yes, the, Mr. Randolph even said that I was the purpose of stopping at Funnies to top off the tank so they could leave in the morning. At any point in time 
during any of the three interviews, did the defendant say that he and Sharon took all of the jewelry inside the house and took it up to Utah the week before May 8th? No. At any point in time, during any of the three interviews, and we'll include the walkthrough in that interview, did the defendant ever say, we plan to take all of the jewelry after May 8th up with us to Utah? No. So the jewelry, according to the defendant, still remained in the house before May 8th and after May 8th? Yes. But he had told Mr. Miller we're going to be gone during those two time periods? Yes. I have another question, though. Did Mr. Miller, did, miss, did the defendant tell you during these three interviews, or at least at some point during the three interviews, that Sharon was up in Utah the week before May 8th? Yes. Did the defendant tell you at some point in these three interviews that Sharon planned to leave to go back up to Utah after May 8th? Yes. So May 8th was the day that she was in town? Yes. Do you remember there being a question on cross-examination about the 911 call and the fact that the defendant offered to help? Do you remember a question like that? Yes. Do you remember also being asked kind of a follow-up question that later on, I believe it's in interview number two, that the defendant expresses to police that he's upset at the thought of his wife sitting on that cold floor? Do you remember those questions? I do. When you listened to the 911 call, does the defendant, when, when the fire department is asking him to provide CPR on his wife who's suffering from a gunshot wound, does he suggest or offer the idea, maybe I should go get the gun nearby Miller? Yes, he did. Does he, in fact, leave his wife instead of doing CPR at that point in time to go retrieve a gun? Yes, just after three minutes in the call. When he returns, when they are again asking to perform CPR, does he then offer Maybe I should go and lock the door. I'm going to go lock the door. Does he say that? Yes, he did. And essentially he stops doing, he doesn't do CPR and, and goes again for a second time, leaving his wife to go lock a door. Yes, at about 3.51 in the call. And then when he finally returns, and again, they're asking him to, you need to perform CPR. Does he offer the suggestion, well, how about if I go open the front door right now? Do you remember that? He, I, he didn't specify front door. Okay. He the said door. the door. Yes, and that was just prior to starting compressions at 6 minutes and 30 seconds. And the fire department tells him, no, you need to do this. Yes. And as you mentioned, six minutes have elapsed at this point. Over six minutes, yes. Do you remember there being a part of cross-examination where... Defense counsel asked you, well, the defendant said uh, while he was in the house he could see Miller. It was, I think it might have been in reference to interview number one. Do you remember that? Interview number one, he said he propped open the door so he could keep an eye on Miller, yes. Okay. But when you look at that, what is the context in which he's, when did he say, how did, well, let's, in that interview, when does he say he opens up the door so he can see Miller? I don't, he just said, I can see him. He's on the floor. But does he also say, and it's referring to page 35, you'll stay with counsel's first statement. So, would it help refresh your recollection to see a copy of the first interview? Certainly. Okay. So, uh, bottom of page 35. Uh, start with this question here, and it's, it's in the middle, counsel. Start with this question here, and I want you to read this question and answer and this question and answer. And let me know if that refreshes your memory of the context of how he's able to see Mr. Miller. Okay. During that interview, does Detective Mogg ask him what he did after he fired multiple shots at Miller? Yes. What does he say he does? He said that he, he slid the carpet underneath the door and propped the door open. And he said so he would be able to see what was happening? Yes. So 
just to be clear, in, in that portion of the year, this is after he has completed shooting at Miller entirely. Yes. Hallway as well as garage. Said after the after the, those two shots. Yes. Okay. Then he props the door open. Yes. It's in the aftermath. Correct. Do you remember there being a number of questions about the ski mask? Yes. There were some questions about sitting. You, you've had a chance to see that ski mask, right? Yes, I have. And, and, and you've been doing this for how many years as an officer? At that point, I'd been in homicide for five years and, and been on the department for quite a bit longer than that. Okay. You've, you've, you've seen clothing that's been shot with, by bullets, right? Yes. Did that ski mask have a single bullet hole in it? No. Did it have any apparent blood in it? No, it did not. Was there any blood transfer somewhere around the ski mask? No, there was not. Despite the fact there may have been some, I don't know, some like stitching or whatever, you, you don't see any bullet holes? No. I would imagine you checked, though, right? Yes, we did. That would be a big deal, right? Yes. A crime scene analyst with gloves on examined the ski mask, and there was no blood on the ground when the mask was picked up as well. Okay. Um, when... He has interviewed these two times as well as during the walkthrough. He does indicate that the mask is on his head. Maybe rolled up, but it's on his head, right? Yes. There was a question. Remember a question of, hey, you know, one reason you might want to take your mask off uh, would be because um, maybe it's twisted and you can't see. Do you remember a question like that on cross? Yes. Detective, could another possibility to take your mask off is there's no reason anymore to hide your identity? Correct. Because the job is done? Yes. Do you remember there being a question about detective? You would agree that one way, uh, one way to kind of um, leave a gun at a scene, or like not to leave evidence behind, is to leave a gun at a scene. Do you remember that question? Yes, to get rid of the murder weapon. Okay. Detective, wouldn't you agree another possible reason? Objection. Leading. I don't think. Even what I've said even suggests an answer. Well, I don't know what the question is, so I'm going to let you finish it. Okay. Detective, would one possible explanation for dropping a gun would be your target is taken care of? Yes. Did the defendant in any of these three interviews with the police ever say that Michael Miller was waiting gun pointed the moment he walked into the hallway? No. There was a lot of questions about the second safe. Do you remember that? I do. At any point in time in these three interviews, did Mr. Randolph ever report to you that anything was taken out of that second safe? No. Call questions about the walkthrough and the defendant's droopy eyes at the beginning of the video. I do. I know that you acknowledge that his eyes were droopy at the beginning. Did you see the same level of droopiness throughout the interview? No, I didn't. Only when Don Bell put the camera up on his shoulder to do the intro. Do you ever recall the defendant crying or weeping during the walkthrough? No. Do you ever recall? Any moment where the defendant needed to emotionally collect himself from recounting what happened to his wife? Not at all. Do you recall whether or not the defendant said when talking about Sharon it was the grossest thing he'd ever seen in his life? I do remember that. And do you recall, do you recall whether or not uh, when discussing Sharon 
supposedly leaving shoes, him kind of slapping the wall and saying, motherfuck, Sharon, Jesus, something like that. Yes. This is one week after she's passed. Yes. There was questions about, do you remember counsel asking you that Mr. Randolph had indicated to some extent he had a belief that Mr. Miller had committed some type of robbery. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Just, just to be clear, did the defendant indicate that he thought that robbery might have happened when Miller was a, was a kid? Yes. And that he just happened to be standing in a store when his brother did the robbery? Yes. And then I think you even asked him as an, as an adult, Mr. Randolph, are you aware of any robberies? And he says, no, I don't think so. Yes. And you did do a review. He didn't have any arrests here in Las Vegas? No, he did not have an ID number. He's never been arrested in Las Vegas. There were questions about uh, the walkthrough and, and bringing in Randy McPhail. Do you remember that? There were a number of questions on, on, on that topic. Do you remember? Yes. Um, you were asked, or maybe you provided an answer saying, I could, you brought him in because you noticed that the, the spatter marks that McPhail looked at appeared to be distinctive. Yes. Do, do you remember? So you were there, kind of obviously, the night of, and then kind of a week later, did they, did it look the same, that area, that particular area? No, it didn't. Uh, again, over, over time, those marks had kind of spread out and became very distinctive. When we turned on the light in the hallway, you could just see them light up in the reflection of the, the hallway light. And so they've, they were very distinctive at that point in time. And so um, I had called for a crime scene analyst to come out and, and document them because you could you could clearly see them then. If you if you had seen them on the night of, would you have had them marked? Well, we did. There's a certain extent we had the impact that we had documented the bullet fragments that had gone up onto the planter shelf, the tissue, the hair, all those things um, we had documented and retrieved. But those the the smaller areas of is going to be cerebral spinal fluid, which is kind of an oily type substance, it had really uh, become distinctive on the wall and I wanted to document them. So that, that's, that's kind of the point I wanted to get to. So those two fragments, right, and the strike, that's in the area where that cerebral fluid is. Yes, the so strike is about eight area, foot up. Yes. So that was an area you literally were processing on that night. Yes. Okay. And you just observed at a later time it became more pronounced, so then you brought someone in to do further documentation. Correct. There were questions, though, about a cleaning crew then coming in, though, after, after the night of these killings. Do you remember that? Right. I think there was a question about uh, carpet had been removed, correct? Yes. Um, but the spatters remained. Yes, they did. So this cleaning crew didn't wipe any of that up? No. Was the bullet strike? repaired by the cleaning crew? No. So that even remained a week later, despite there being a cleaning crew? Yes. You were asked a question of, you would presume the walls were wiped down. I think you answered yes to the question, correct? Yes. Okay, but you, you weren't fair, to be fair, you weren't there, right? No, I just know the lower portions where there was blood on the door jam, blood on the door, those, those areas had been wiped down. Okay, so those lower areas were. Certainly. Right? Um, but the upper areas, Apparently weren't because you, you processed it, right? Correct. And just to be clear, in the hallway, did you observe any blood in that hallway on night one? Yes. Okay. Sharon Randolph's blood. Sharon, okay. I'm sorry. In the area where Mr. Randolph says he shot Mr. Miller, do you see any blood there? No blood. And, and you were not alone when you did the walk of that area? Correct. No. How many people were with you? There was um, Sergeant Alby, uh, Detective Mogg, Detective Hardy, Detective Long, Detective uh, uh, Jeff Smith, the senior crime scene analyst, uh, Gary Reed, the uh, crime scene analyst supervisor, initially to, to look, and then it was later processed with fewer people. Detective, if you and your fellow detectives or CSAs noticed something on night one in that portion of the hallway, would you have documented it? Certainly. There were questions, you remember questions about the, the clothing items and the, and the sneakers uh, nearby Mr. Miller's body? Yes. 
Um, what was on Mr. Miller's feet that night? A pair of size 9D cowboy boots. This is a, I mean, presumably it's a jewelry heist. He's wearing cowboy boots. Yes. He had sneakers with him, but he opted for cowboy boots. Yes. Regarding the life insurance, um, you were asked uh, that the documents were signed by Mrs. Randolph, and you indicated in the affirmative, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, but you weren't present when those documents were being signed, correct? No, I wasn't. So do you know who, in fact, prepared, you know, filled out all the paperwork? No, I don't. Okay. The paperwork was signed in Utah, is that right? Yes, in Ogden, Utah. Where Mr. Randolph's family is from? Yes. Okay, I'll rephrase. What year were those policies signed in? I believe in 2006. Okay, was that before or after she was legally married? Before. There was a question about, and you learned wages paid for, Sharon's wages paid for the premium. Did that apply to the Boston Mutual policy only? Yes. Okay, and that's the $22,000 one, correct? Correct. That did not include the two hundred thousand or the hundred thousand dollar policy. No. Or the ten thousand dollar stone bridge. No. There were questions about the fire extinguisher. Do you recall being asked how Mr. Miller's body was lying next to the fridge? Yes. Okay. Do you recall the defendant saying during his walkthrough that he, in fact, rolled him over into that position? Yes, and you could tell based on the blood pooling that he had moved to the new position. There were questions about um, his girlfriend, Mr. Miller's girlfriend, having a vehicle, something along those lines. During your investigation, was there any reported undeclared vehicle sitting outside the Rancho Santa Fe residence? No. And there were questions at the end about Sharon, defendants saying, about talking about shortcomings. Sharon's gambling, he's too cocky. And then I think the, the last question was that Miller didn't have a steady job. Do you recall that? Yes. Do you recall the answer wasn't that, but in fact, Simply, he didn't work. Yes. Page 48, counsel. Courts and don't. Yeah. I have no further questions for this case. Yes, Detective, just so it's clear, in his very first statement, recorded statement, on May 9th, at, starting in 12.30 a.m., he is asked, do you fire any shots in the garage? And he answers, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's, oh, I'm sorry, page 56, it's the last question. And it's interview number one. That's correct. Okay. Let me let them get there. Okay. No, page 56. The, the very last question and answer. Okay. Okay. And so, just so they're, oh, they're there by now. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, when asked, did you fire any shots in that garage? Right? Yes. So on the, within hours of this incident, it's fair to say that Thomas Randolph is saying, I fired shots in that garage. Right? Yes. Mr. Hamner asked you about the fact that Sharon and Tommy had been away to Utah for the week before, right? Yes. And that although they were celebrating Mother's Day at the charcoal room, they were again going to Utah, right? Yes. And you were aware 
or at least you understood that Thomas Randolph was going to deposit, had had some money, was going to deposit some money in the bank, right? That's what he said. And he, and he was with Michael Miller, right? Yes. And that he didn't make it to the bank, right? Yeah, he said he missed his turn, so he didn't go to the bank. He complains to you, Thomas Randolph, that you guys didn't find a large amount of cash that he had around the, around the house, hidden around the house. Uh, and even on him that we didn't find the cash that he had on him. Okay. And he was going to Utah the next day. Yes. You learned that Michael Miller had been involved in house-sitting for the Randolphs, right? I know there was some contemplation of him house-sitting, even that Mr. Miller uh, requested that a note or a, a note be given to him so that if anybody came by, it, he would be able to justify his being there. Okay. I don't know that he ever actually house-sat for them. You said that there were chest compressions done. Do you remember saying that? Yes. Now, with regard to hiding identity in a mask, a mask is used by robbers, burglars to hide their identity. Fair? Yes. If the intent is to shoot Sharon Randolph, you don't need to hide your identity from her, right? Because she's not going to live through this. So, isn't that right? I don't know why he would have the mask on when he shot her. Right. Other than he's committing a burglary. Right? And he, right? Or he's shooting somebody he's very familiar with and he didn't want to have and if perceived. You're gonna, if you're going I, I, I'm going to object and I'm going to ask the witness to be allowed to answer his, finish his answer. I don't mean to be on the bench before you go on. Sir? Can Mr. Finish, can you finish his answer? He did finish oh, Okay, his answer. I apologize. I didn't no, he did to my knowledge, were you finished, Detective O'Kell? I, I don't know. We were kind of talking over each other. <laughs> oh, I thought you finished. I apologize. No, or that he Detec is shooting Detective. somebody. Detective, Just, could okay. you answer my question? Well, no, the, the ruling is that he gets to finish his answer. And he said he was. No, he never answered that question. Detective O'Kell, had you finished? Or I had not finished, Your Honor. We were talking over each other, and then Mr. Hamner said something, so I stopped talking. Okay. What's the remainder of the answer, Detective? Or that you're going to shoot somebody that you're very familiar with and you don't want them to see your face when you do it. Just in case when you die, you would be able to identify the person? Because no. if you're dead, if the plan is to shoot somebody dead in your own home, they're not going to be able to identify you later on. Right? Fair? No, they wouldn't be able to identify you. A lot of burglars wear masks. Isn't that fair? I don't, I don't know. In your experience, do robbers and burglars wear masks? I would say robbers more often than burglars. Burglars go into places that are unoccupied and are likely not to be seen. And there are lots of cameras that people have around, right? More so now than then, yes. And in fact, throughout your career, when a homicide happens, you go to neighbors, to businesses around there and look for cameras, right? We did then, and now you're finding ring doorbell cameras. You're finding all kind of surveillance cameras. Mr. Randolph said it was the grossest thing he ever saw. It was the grossest thing he seen. It was gross, right? He did, multiple times. You've seen the pictures of Sharon Randolph's face. Yes. Right? After she shot, right? Yes. It's horrible, isn't it? It is. The wound to the back of her head is horrible, right? It is. You would agree with me that... Thomas Randolph told you he loved her, right? He told us he did, yes. And that he, she was the best thing that ever happened to him, right? Yes. And that if Thomas Randolph came from holding hands with her and rolled her over and saw his wife looking like that, it has to be about as horrible as it can be in life. Isn't that fair? To roll your wife over. I, I'd agree that everything you just said is one of the most horrible things I've ever heard. You said that Miller had not obtained any criminal record in the whole five months that he'd been here, right? Whole five months he'd been here. We didn't find a record on it. But you know he committed murder while he was here, right? He did. And we know that he was stealing while he was here, right? Again, we never spoke to the owner of the contents uh, of that wallet that didn't belong to him. So, and we, we know that he had a cell phone that did not belong to him. 
and we know that he had that beautiful ring in his left pocket that most certainly didn't belong to him. Right? I'd agree with that. And that makes him a thief, doesn't it? I do. I agree with that. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in the boots, cowboy boots, did it have the name Philippe? Did you ever notice that? I know there was writing on it. I don't know if it's... Philippe. I don't remember that it said... You don't Philippe. remember? Okay. Yeah. Do you remember whether Sharon Randolph had given uh, Michael Miller those boots? That was my understanding. Now, with regard to those hallways, you said... Strike that. There was absolutely no arrows put up on May 9th, May 8th of arrows showing where all this matter was. No, we didn't. And your statement is that it was there, it just became more clear when you came back a week later. Right? Yes. Okay, well, crime scene analyst Smith, right, he was there. Yes, he was. And, and it's his job to record and, and collect and preserve the evidence, right? It is. You don't want somebody coming in, hazmat coming in, and a whole bunch of these people, or one of them, or two of them, cleaning the area up, and then you come back when it's more visible. That doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense to fail to preserve a crime scene or evidence from it if you can see it. Is that if, fair? If you can see it, and uh, you can document it, and you can photograph it, and you can recover it, yes. And that was not done on either the 8th or the 9th, was it? On that material on the upper wall, no. Or the two shell casings. We found them on the 15th as well. Nothing further. material did you observe it did you did, did you observe the cerebral fluid on may 8th at the early morning hours of may 9th no okay so if you had seen it you would have documented it at that yeah. time yes um let's go to the top uh, there was talk about uh, he indicated he was depositing money during those interviews does the defendant also say that he's trying to withdraw money as well yes so he kind of, it's not equivocal, he kind of goes back and forth about whether he was depositing or withdrawing, is that right? Right, moving money around, yes. But, but let's just assume he has all of this money on him. Does the defendant state that when he walked in the door, Michael Miller's waiting right there to blow him away? No. And just to be clear, Mr. Miller presumably abandoned the 38 that he killed his wife with? Yes and then struggled to produce another weapon in relation to the defendant? Yes. At least that's according to the defendant. It's according to one statement. The first statement, he said he had the gun in his right hand. Okay. Um, there were questions about, oh, you know, there's cameras and neighbors around. You remember, remember that? Yes. Okay. Um, typically, those cameras, where are they typically located? Are they look, located sometimes in the front of people's houses? On the garage, on the doorbell camera, yes. So if you were to exit out the garage, you'd have to open up the garage? Yes. And then walk out to all those cameras? Correct. And did the defendant say that was the direction, the direction of the garage, is the general area that Mr. Miller is walking towards when he encounters it? That he was going towards the garage? Yes. Yes. But there's a back door that was open? Yes. Uh, lastly, there were questions about how the defendant indicated that uh, you were asked. Didn't he indicate that Sharon was the best thing that ever happened to him? Yes. But he also indicated that he openly cheated on her. Yes. No further questions. Anything else, Michelle? No. Does anybody in the jury have any questions for this witness? Did you write your question on a full sheet of paper with a name in your journal? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
TSA is find any blood on either car in the garage? No, we did not. Do you ever recall Mr. Randolph telling you if he usually was the driver when going out on dates with Mrs. Randolph? No, he didn't indicate one way or the other. Why were many items not impounded by police? Well, even though, and I don't like to admit this publicly, so don't tell anyone, but um, even though I was absolutely sure that there were things at the scene that didn't add up and didn't make sense, there was still a possibility that I was wrong and that we could, those things could be explained. One of the reasons for doing the walkthrough is so that he could come back and maybe explain some of those things, right? I didn't think that that was true at the time. And so there were decisions on impounding certain things like Mr. Randolph's clothing. So you have to do what's, you know, almost like a return on investment. What do I think I'm gonna get from Mr. Randolph's clothing? Sharon's blood, Mike Miller's blood, gunshot residue, right? So if I'm at the scene and I think there's a possibility that I'm wrong, yes, but I don't believe that I am, do I want Mr. Randolph to think that we bought into to what had been staged to continue his cooperation, right? So yes, it's a possibility I was wrong, but I didn't think so, and so I didn't want to do things that were going to make him think that we didn't, we didn't believe it, right? So the decision was made not to impound his clothing so that he would think, all right, they bought what was at the house. They bought it lock, stock, and barrel, and I'm okay. So when we continued our conversation with him, and when Detective Mogg reached out to him, he was still willing to come and now show us physically at the scene, contextually, how it happened, and there was still that possibility that he might have a reasonable explanation for the things that we saw, not only at the scene, but that we verified at autopsy with the wound pattern and the, and the trajectory of the bullets. I don't think that happened. I, I was even more convinced of, of what we had that night after the walkthrough. Okay. Did Mr. Randolph tell you that he enjoyed driving? I don't remember him saying that. No. Did you ask to have the gloves tested for gunpowder? No. In the June 3rd, 2008 interview, Thomas mentions he had the 38 millimeter gun with him when he dropped off Mike, the same gun that killed Sharon. Do you ever remember him saying that he had any guns with him when he left with Sharon to dinner at the Santa Fe? Well, he the 30, it's, you're thinking 38 millimeters, actually the nine millimeter by 18, the Makarov is what he said he had earlier. And then w there was some discussion about, if you recall, whether or not he had the gun on him when he was in the casino. So, and he was saying that he didn't have it on him in the casino, not because he wasn't willing to do that, but he just didn't have it on him at the time. Did Mr. Randolph tell you if he had two 38 millimeters of revolver? <coughs> No, I mean, he, the 38 um, revolver that was in the drum room, he said came from the clock that was hanging on the wall. It's hanging upside down. And then you close it, actually says place gun upside down. So that's what it's for is to conceal the gun. That's where the 38 came from. And then it did belong to Mr. Randolph. The other uh, revolver came from a basket in the master bedroom or from a drawer in the master bedroom which um, you know, there was an admission that, that Mr. Miller knew where both of those firearms are located. Is there video surveillance of when Tom Randolph drops off Mike by the Fiesta Casino or the area he mentions in interview two? No. While you conduct crime scene investigations, do you usually have a body camera? No. Did you have one and if so, was it on? No. Did the officers on the scene have body cameras turned on? No. This is pre-body camera. The night of May 8, 2008, or a week later after you went back, did you ask any neighbors if they had any outdoor camera footage showing Mike Miller's arrival, the Randolph's arrival, and when first responders arrived? 
That night, um, the neighborhood canvas was done by Detective Long. I don't know if he had anybody else's system, like maybe from patrol, but all of those questions would have happened. And again, this is kind of predates the prevalence of those types of cameras that you that we're finding on pretty much every, almost every residence now. In your opinion, where would a person have to be standing and shooting for the shell casings to land in the areas they were found? The first shell casing that is in the hallway, just inside the threshold, um, that round would have been fired near the doorway, more than likely, and bounce around inside the hallway. The um, shell casings that were found a week later in the toolbox and over by the ju milk jug or water bottle, right over by the water heater, we believe came off of the, um, the refrigerator. So the arm was extended into the garage. The shell casing ejected to the right and went off the refrigerator and ended up over there. The shot that Mr. Miller, I mean, excuse me, that Mr. Randolph describes firing into Mr. Miller as he's in the threshold, aiming the gun downward, would also have come off of the refrigerator and ended up over where we have the shell casing on the west side of the Hyundai Tucson. That bullet flattened out and was underneath the uh, right rear passenger um, area of the Hyundai Tucson. Was Mike Miller's girlfriend identified and interviewed? I know we had a name um, for her, but uh, we don't have an interview with her, and I never spoke to her. Steve, do you have any follow-up based on the juror question? Just one very briefly. Why was no GSR testing done on gloves? because they were involved in a, in a shooting, and that was demonstrably so, and so you're going to get gunshot residue, there's no question. Okay, so, you, so it, it sounds like you just presumed he was involved in the shooting, therefore there's no need to test the gloves? Right. Or, or he was shot at, I guess conversely he was also shot at as well. Yeah, everything in that area is gonna have gunshot residue on it. So whether he's receiving bullets or shooting bullets, you're expecting GSR to be there? Yes. And GSR, does GSR, is it able to tell you timing or direction, directionality or who's shooting at who? No. Okay. Any follow-up, Mr. Owen? Yes. Okay. You have previously stated that a case where it lands when it's ejected is unpredictable. Fair? Specifically where it lands, yes. Because they bounce all over the place. Yes. People can kick them. People can kick them. You said when we're talking about the 38 caliber that kind of comes out of the clock and is used to murder Sharon Randolph, it's Sharon's gun, isn't it? That's my understanding. According to Mr. Randolph, it's her gun. You also said that from that night, when you were asked by one of the jurors in a question about why you didn't preserve evidence, one of the things you told us just now is that you didn't believe Mr. Randolph, things weren't adding up, so you wanted to keep him talking and so you didn't preserve certain information or certain evidence. Isn't that what you told us? I said that I could be wrong about my impressions at the scene there was still a possibility that I was wrong. And then we, if with that cooperation he came back, he may be able to explain what happened at the scene con con uh, contextually and be able to show why those things that I had a problem with were the way they were. So that is one of the reasons you failed to preserve evidence? Is that what you were telling the jury? It's not a failure to preserve evidence. It's what you expect to get from that evidence versus what I would be if I was to take again, for example, his clothing, you know, and we've done that before, where now you put somebody in what we call a bunny suit, you know, where they're sitting there in the interview room, their clothing's taken from them, and I saw that as a possibility to then have Mr. Randolph think that we weren't believing his story at all, and so we wouldn't see that level of cooperation that we continue to have. Detective O'Kelly, that includes a safe in the closet? That big safe? I never saw the safe. 
We're also dealing with the fact. Okay, so you never saw that tape? So you didn't, you didn't take anything or preserve that or any pictures of it on the night in question, correct? Other than the one picture that you have where you can see a portion of the safe. That concludes uh, recross of information. Any follow-up, Mr. Allen? No, you're wrong. Do the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have any further questions for this witness? Okay, you can write your question on a full sheet of paper with your name and your juror number. Any of the two vehicles, and if so, did you find any guns or any valuable evidence? No. Okay. Any follow up, Mr. Hammond? Nope. Mr. Orr. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any further questions for this witness? Okay, seeing no response to Jack, Governor New York, excuse me, thank you very much for your testimony over the last two days. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our afternoon recess briefly. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors in any way.
Officer back on the record of the city 250966, stating that of Thomas Randolph. Mr. Randolph is president of his attorney, deputy district attorney on behalf of the state. Do both parties give their defense further? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Stating that card next week. Your Honor, at this time, the state rests. Okay. If anything, you have any ways that you'd like to do that? Your Honor, we at this time would call Mr. Michael Hogue. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as in Victor and W. Your Honor, the state has agreed to admit for the admission of proposed exhibit V as
Mr. Hoag, did people you believe to be detectives come out and talk to you about this in approximately 2008, yes or no? Yes. Could you give us a description of those two, how many were there? Two. Could you give us a description of what these two individuals look like, if you know? I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't be comfortable giving a description. That concludes direct examination. Do you want to read that? No. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. How are you? I'm well, you? Good, thank you. Um, you described that um, you had your backpack on the, the Greyhound bus, and it, if I understood you correctly, it was going from L.A. to Vegas? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so back home? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Sorry, you just have to say yes or no. Okay. Um, do you have any uh, recollection of, of when this was? Like, like, was it, you know, after Christmas or maybe near Easter? Any, any kind of time frame you can give us? believe it was summertime. Summertime of, of 2007? I don't even know. Okay, fair enough. So, I mean, as you, I know it's a long time ago, yeah. but as you sit here with us this afternoon, it sounds like you're, you remember it as summer, but maybe unclear on the year or? Yeah, I'm unclear on the year. Okay, so, yeah. fair enough. And then um, I assume you were on the bus ride uh, alone because you weren't with someone yes. who saw it? Yes. Um, did you, when you when you noticed that your belongings were gone, did you report it to Greyhound? Or yeah, I asked the bus driver and talked to the bus station and kept calling them. Nothing was ever turned in. Okay, so. well, not a lot of follow up investigation. Yeah, they didn't try to find it. Okay, but you you made an effort to to see if you could get your stuff back. I did. Okay, um, you don't know anything about. Um, what happened on Rancho Santa Fe Drive on May the 8th of 2008, do you? No, ma'am. Okay. You don't, you, that picture that Mr. Oram uh, put up of the African-American man, have you ever seen him before? No, ma'am. Um, do you even know his name? Well, just because they told me. Right, but pri that no, was the prior to question. That, no. Prior to that, did you know his name is at all? No. Do you know the name um, Sharon Randolph or Thomas Randolph? Nothing like that. Um, and... When were you contacted to be here with us this afternoon? Um, last month, I believe. Last month, okay. And then, um, I guess you don't have any idea, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't have any idea how your identification ended up in someone's pocket that is involved in our case, do you? It was stolen. But do you know that he's the one that stole it? Cause we, you I know, can't say that. You can't say that, right? Because yeah. you have no idea. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sean. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury have any questions? Okay, seeing no response, sir, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Defense attorney, Bobby Lesperman. Defense calls Jeremy I do. Excuse me, ma'am. Jeremy Stafford, J E R E M Y S T A F F O R D. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon, sir. What do you do for a living? Um, I'm currently uh, the uh, military and law enforcement manager for Mossberg Firearms and I also provide expert testimony for Titan Consulting. Okay, um, Mossberg Firearms is a 
relatively large and well-known uh, distributor of firearms here in the United States, right? Yes, sir. Um, predominantly um, known for shotguns. You agree with yes, that? sir. Okay. And in fact, you mentioned law enforcement and military. Are you responsible for the Mossberg accounts related to um, shotguns that are provided to law enforcement and military? Yes, sir. Okay. Prior to that, I want to talk to you, what you talk to you about what you did before you were in that role. First of all, how long have you been doing that with Mossberg? About seven months, sir. Okay. Uh, prior to that, did you have a military career? Yes, sir. What branch? United States Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserve. And how long were you in the Marine Corps and Marine Corps Reserve? Fourteen years, sir. Okay. Um, what rank were you at the time you um, discharged? Staff Sergeant. Okay. Did you see combat? Yes, sir. While you were in the military, did you ever receive any commendations? Yes, sir. Numerous commendations. Did you ever receive any awards from the Marine Corps? Yes, sir. And specifically, which one? Um, my highest being the Bronze Star with a V for Valor in Combat, sir. Okay. That um, is a distinction that is given to people that display uh, bravery and valor in a live combat situation. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when you departed from the Marine Corps, did you work in law enforcement? Yes, sir. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about that? I spent 25 years on the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, nine years of which was the department firearms subject matter expert. Okay. Did you retire from the LAPD? Yes, sir. Okay. In your role of the, in the LAPD, you mentioned that you were the subject matter expert on firearms. What did that role consist of? Um, there was uh, several fingers coming off of that hand, sir. So uh, on one hand, I was in charge of updating all the policies and procedures. Uh, I wrote all the lesson plans. Uh, I had a, a fairly large part in all of the testing and evaluation of new equipment, firearms, and um, ammunition, things of that nature. And I also served as the uh, a fact finder and an advisor for command staff in areas of policy and training regarding firearms. Okay, specifically as it relates to firearms, it sounds like I was just taking a few notes while you were answering there that you were responsible for testing, evaluation, training, and authoring essentially department policies related to the use of firearms in the land. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you, the last thing you mentioned there, uh, you were a fact finder. What, did, what does that mean? So um, anytime there was a critical incident or use of force involving a firearm, there were several different steps of the investigation. Um, rather than being an investigator, what I would do is I would um, gather the facts from what the investigators were finding. I would present those to the command staff, and that would allow them to make determinations on um, whether or not policy was going to be influenced by these things or um, to provide that information to the chief if there was discipline that was going to be involved. So okay. it, I don't mean to interrupt you, but jury's heard a lot of information from investigators in this case. Not really your role in that capacity your last nine years with the LAPD. Right? Correct, sir. Um, more of a administrative role? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you mentioned the term critical incident involving firearms. Like in layman's terms, is that when an officer or a detective or employee of the LAPD discharges their duty weapon? Yes, sir. An officer involved shooting. How many officer-involved shootings were you involved uh, in as part of this role? <laughs> um, over 40. Okay. Do you know an exact number? I, I don't. I would have to go through. And at the time, I didn't think I'd be doing this, so I didn't take okay. notes and keep a tally. Several dozen. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Okay. In addition to your work with the LAPD and in the military, have you authored... Um, periodicals, information, uh, papers related to firearms in the firearms industry? Yes, sir. I was the, uh, up until very recently, I was the handgun editor for Guns and Ammo magazine and uh, several of the other uh, related sister publications. And uh, I am also the host or was the host of a television show called The Best Defense, which dealt with the legal, moral, and technical aspects of self defense. Okay. Um, for those of us in the room that may not know, Guns and Ammo, is that a magazine? Yes, sir. And is it the largest firearms-related magazine in the world? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, when you said editor um, related to handguns, anything in that 
publication involving handguns during your tenure there? Did you have some part in it? Uh, if I didn't, it's because I chose not to, sir. So work would come in, and I would either decide to take it or I would pass it, pass it on. Okay. Did you write? Yes, sir. Did you edit? Yes, sir. Did you consult? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you mentioned Vest Defense. That was a TV show on the Outdoor Network? Yes, sir. And it related specifically to self-defense, defense of others, defense of home? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about some of your education, training, and experience prior to your testimony today. Um, do you have any idea how many hours that you've accumulated um, in instructional hours in use of force situations, um, dynamic use of force situations, shooting incidents, things like that? Specific to that area, I would I would guess it to be somewhere right around 500, 600 hours right in there. Okay. And your total amount of hours training related to the use of firearms and use of force, um, would you say that's in the thousands? It's in the th I, I couldn't even begin to. Okay. Could you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury some of the instruction, tactical training, use of force um, hours that you've accumulated? Sure, absolutely. So, um, one of the things that I did was uh, I was a member of the very early original uh, handgun instructor course. Uh, it was a course that I eventually rewrote because I went out and I took other training to bring it back. So that would include uh, training up at Gunside Academy, um, training at the Surefire Institute, which is a low light force on force heavy training uh, company, uh, firearms training associates, um, Bill Rogers Shooting School, which is re which is renowned and is considered one of the most difficult shooting schools in the world, where it involves not just shooting, but also a lot of decision making, things of that nature, so that we could bring it back and uh, kind of collate that and improve the uh, training environment at the Los Angeles Police Department. Okay. Did you go to the LAPD Supervisor School? Yes, sir. As well as the United States uh, Marine Corps Urban Tactical School. Yes, sir. Okay. Are you familiar with the term perceptual distortion? Yes, sir. What is that? So perceptual distortion is um, the, it's a layman term for what is clinically known as cognitive distortion. Um, and it's just it's a little bit easier for people to understand the perceptual distortion because what happens is in any high-stress critical incident, you have uh, what uh, Dr. Epstein had in one of his studies had noted is you have your rational and your experiential mind.
not entirely sure where we were before we were interrupted, but I'm talking about a definition of perceptual distortion, sir. Okay. Um, do you have kind of a succinct definition of what that is? Yeah. So when you go into a, um, a crisis mode, for lack of a better term, uh, your your brain doesn't process information the same way it would if you were thinking rationally. The best example I could give that I think most people would understand would be when you're driving and you encounter a hazard or obstacle that you weren't anticipating and you get that, that jolt and everything slows down, you get the adrenaline rush and you just react to it. You swerve out of the way. You don't think about it. It just happens. But you don't really remember all the details. You might remember a couple of things it might seem closer than it was. It might seem like time slowed down. There might have been a, lar a loud bang that you didn't even hear. Those are some common perceptual distortions that people encounter just throughout standard, uh, uh, you know, adrenaline-filled incidents during the day. Okay, that's kind of a simplified version. Yes, um, sir. As I hear you describing it, perceptual distortion to you, is it in an incident that's like a for instance, a life or death situation. Yes, sir. Where you maybe don't hear or see or do things the same way you thought you did. That's correct. Okay. Um, have you studied perceptual distortion as it relates specifically to dynamic shooting incidents? Yes, sir. And when I say dynamic shooting incidents, what do you hear when I say that term? The closest uh, relation I would have to that would be an officer-involved shooting. You know, okay. something where somebody had to use a firearm to defend their life or defend the life of somebody else and uh, resulting in a discharge of that firearm and uh, oftentimes striking another person. Okay. In your work in law enforcement and the military, um, did you, I guess, have you, have you identified, read, and absorbed studies related to those types of scenarios? Yes. Um, might be kind of a silly question, but probably not a lot of information out there about the mind and thought process of an ordinary everyday, everyday Joe in that situation, but there probably is a lot of information related to officer-involved shootings. Yes, that's where the vast majority of the information comes out of because the better records are kept. There's more documentation. There's more investigation. Okay. Um, what studies have you reviewed related to perceptual distortion in a shooting critical incident? Well, there's only been, uh, the, there's been nine big ones. Uh, of those, we have some of the ones that we referenced earlier. We have Art Wall, which is one of the most recent and um, most complete studies. We have Klinger, which was one of the largest studies. We have um, <coughs> Honig and Roland, um, Honig and... Sultan, and then um, Solomon and Horn was one of the very early ones in the 1980s. Those are kind of the big studies. There's been smaller ones, but those are the largest ones that really strove to get a large number of people in them. Okay. When we talk about perceptual distortion, what types of things um, in your review of studies and your review of on-the-job critical incidents at the LAPD, what type of distortions would you expect to see? So in the vast majority of these types of incidents, we get auditory exclusion. What and auditory exclusion is when you are aware of something that should be causing sound, but you can't hear it. So in other words, oftentimes um, police officers will shoot, and they'll say, I didn't even hear the gun. And that's one of the reasons why police officers uh, and citizens, for that matter, have trouble recounting how many rounds they fired because they're not hearing the rounds. Oftentimes, their ears don't even ring afterwards. And the next one would be, the next largest one by incident would be tunnel vision, which Guess is what? when you are so hyper-focused on what is exactly in front of you that you um, are not able to take in all the details of the area around it. Okay. In other words, you see one thing and to the exclusion of others. Yes, sir. Um, anything else? Well, sure. I mean, moving down the list, we have um, a lot of time distortion. So in other words, um, and I think most people can relate to this when you get scared or you're going through some sort of critical, critical incident,
things seem to slow down in the vast majority of people that experience uh, a time distortion will be things slowed down. Very small percentage get things sped up, but that's a very small percentage as opposed to the people who everything seems to slow down, go in slow motion. The other thing is you get heightened visual acuity. So in other words, the things that you are focused on, if you are experiencing tunnel vision, you'll see crazy detail. You know, some, one of the things that I remember reading in a report was as casings were going across a police officer's face, his partner was shooting, he could see the federal on the base of it, which I, it was, that, that's pretty amazing here. The, the mind's an amazing thing. Um, and then lastly, we get these uh, distance distortions or distortions where people don't see or they see something that's not there or they remember it differently than what it was. So it could be, for instance, the color, you know, the color of the person, of the suspect's hat. It was a blue hat. Well, no, it was actually a black hat. So those things tend to get distorted on a fairly regular basis. Okay, when we talk about time distortion, you mentioned slowing down. Does that often include time estimation? Like in other words, yes. someone involved in a critical incident asked to give a time minutes, hours, et cetera. Like how long the incident took? Yes. Yes, that, it, that's very common distortion. People yeah. uh, often uh, underestimate the amount of time it, it took. Okay, one of the things you mentioned a moment ago is like the number of rounds. What did you mean by that? How many times the person shoots? So, you know, if you can't hear the gun go bang, then it's very difficult to keep track of how many times you pull the trigger, in fact, when people are scared, even people who have a moderate level of training, once they start shooting, it's very difficult to stop shooting until the situation changes. So if they're not hearing how many bullets are going off, how many times the, the gun is, is discharging, then it's very difficult to get an accurate count of rounds. Okay. In the studies that you've reviewed and your experience in real life, um, have you encountered situations where um, things like the number of rounds fired from a firearm is inaccurately reported? Yes. What about the distance from object to object? Yes. What about the time frame in which a situation takes place? Yes. What about situations where large, obvious things to other witnesses are completely missed by someone reporting? Yes. And vice versa? Yes. Um, I want to ask you, um, in addition to the things that you've studied in a classroom environment or in a research environment, have you personally experienced these types of distortions? Yes, sir. Could you give us an example? Sure. Um, earlier I referenced the Bronze Star with a V. When I was in Iraq, even though I had had a lot of training, uh, it was the first time I, w I had ever engaged in combat. And I remember distinctly bringing my gun up, discharging the gun, and I didn't hear anything. I was cognizant of the recoil, and I was cognizant that I was cycling the action, but there was no sound that I could hear from my gun. But I could hear gunshots in the distance. Likewise, when I shot the person in front of me, I experienced tunnel vision, and I remember thinking to myself, because I, I did have a nice high level of training, I need, to, I need to assess, I need to break my tunnel vision. I was able to realize I had it. And so as I turned to my left, there was another person standing there 10 yards away from me, shooting at me with an AK-47, and I had no idea. I had no idea until I turned, not even 45 degrees, maybe, 30 degrees or so, and there was a person shooting at me. And it wasn't until I saw him, and the t there was two bullets, one hit between my legs, and I remember feeling it, and then one went by my right ear, and then all of a sudden I could hear really, I could hear really well again, uh, and I was, able to, uh, I was able to engage. 
when we did a critical incident debrief, when they put me in for the award. Let me just stop you for a second there. What's a critical incident debrief? When we talked about it afterwards. Okay. In, order, in other words, to gain group experience from the experience that I had. I, I stated, I told them, I said, they were coming through a hole in the wall. Anytime you win an award for valor, they investigate it in the military. When they went back to investigate it, there was no hole in the wall. They were coming over the wall. To this day, I can describe to you, I can draw you a picture of what this hole in the wall looked like. There was no hole in the wall. Okay. They were climbing over it. So in a situation where your life's on the line, you have to f engage a firearm towards someone else and someone's shooting at you, um, you didn't see things that were there. Yes. You saw things that weren't there. Yes. You couldn't hear things that you know happened. Yes. Okay. In your dozens of officer-involved shootings, would you often be part of like a public safety debrief following a critical shooting incident? Yes. What is that? So a public safety statement. In my department, we call it a public safety statement. And it was just a very brief question and answer that the persons who was involved in the incident is compelled to give. <laughs> and it's so that a supervisor coming on the scene can send people out, one, to see if there's a, a suspect, two, to see if those bullets impacted anything, and three, to see if anybody else got impacted by those bullets. So that we could make sure that we could triage a scene as quickly and efficiently as possible. Okay, sounds like a very brief statement by an officer who discharges his or her duty weapon about how many rounds they think they shot, what direction they yes. think they went, to see if someone else could have been injured. Very, and, and the verbiage was very um, ambiguous, so about how many rounds, you know, general direction, things like that, because we understand that people's minds aren't quite right, and we don't want to we don't want to put them in a, in a place where they feel like they're giving inaccurate information. Okay. So we try to keep it wide. When you say people's minds aren't quite right, you're talking about someone who's discharged a weapon. In yes, a somebody who's gone through a critical incident or a, you know. Might not get all the details right. Correct. Okay. Um, after that public safety statement is done, is there an investigation done by the LAPD into the officer involved shooting? Yes. Um, did it often happen when you would actually not you, but whoever's investigating it that you're kind of supervising, um, would the investigation often reveal that the details of what an officer gave in a public safety statement were just wrong? Yes. Did that happen quite often? Yes. Um, was that kind of an expectation in law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Um, in your department, when there was an officer-involved shooting, were the officers who discharged the weapons required to participate in that public safety statement? Yes. So they were compelled, they had to as part of their employment? Yes. Were they also required to give a statement or a walkthrough of the incident? Yes, there's always a statement, um, not necessarily right away, depending on the situation, but there's always a statement given. And then there's generally a walkthrough, although now with the advent of body-worn video, that's not 100%. Sometimes the investigators will just stick to the body-worn video. Okay, you mentioned video. I want to talk to you about video in a couple different ways, okay? Um, many times when there was a walkthrough or a statement, uh, let's just stick with the public safety statement. Would investigators often have the benefit of an actual video of, this, of the situation as it unfolded? Yes. And many times would that video tell a very different story than what the officer recalled? Yes. In fact, is that very common? Yes, it is, sir. Does it happen in most shootings? Yes, sir. There's, there's a, in the vast majority, I mean, I would never say 100%, but in the vast majority that I was a part of, there was some sort of, uh, I'm just going to fall back on the word distortion, where. Okay. In addition to the ones that you're a part of, the studies that you testified about previously, do those indicate a high percentage of shootings involving some type of distortion? It's a spectrum, but it. On the high side, it's about 95%. Okay. Um, when you mentioned that there would be a walkthrough, was that also compelled with the LAPD? In other words, did the officer have to engage in that? Yes. And if there's a walkthrough, they're allowed to have um, representation. Okay. So when the officer is compelled to walk through sometime later, he or she can have a lawyer with them? Yes, sir. To advise them? Yes, sir. Okay. And they're required to do that? Yes, sir. As part of their employment? 
Yes, sir. Prior to that walkthrough, did those officers get the benefit of reviewing that body-worn camera? Yes, sir. In other words, they get to see what happened before they do the walkthrough? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let me ask you this question. In those walkthroughs, the 40 or so that you've been a part of, and you're intimately familiar with the policies of the LAPD, is that right? Yes, sir. Are those walkthroughs ever recorded for evidentiary purposes? No, sir. Why not? Well, I would imagine it because before the actual body worn video became part of it, they tended to not be 100% accurate. So the investigators would take everybody through the walkthroughs and then use that as a starting point for the investigation. Okay. It sounds like recording it for evidentiary purposes may not be reliable. Is that true? That was the general thought, yes, sir. Okay. Um, the type of recall that you're describing and the perceptual distortion of that recall, um, is that more prevalent in less trained individuals? Yes. Um, for instance, let's say I'm a Navy SEAL and I've gone on a hundred missions and I've fired my firearm in combat situations dozens and dozens of times. Statistically speaking, would I be more likely to remember detail? Yes. An individual who is not in law enforcement, isn't in the military, doesn't have training, statistically speaking, would they be less likely to recall? In my experience, yes, sir. Okay. Um, would you expect a citizen who discharges a weapon in a critical incident where a loved one's been killed or they have to kill someone to remember with exact detail things like distance? No, sir. Location? No, sir. Number of shots? No, sir. Exact time? No, sir. That'd be an unrealistic expectation, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. sir good how are you sir I'm doing well good. Um, so uh, if, if I hear you correctly um, your background involves currently being um, a manager with Mossberg correct yes sir um, you do expert consulting for Titan correct yes sir and and that is essentially what you're performing a function here today right yes sir as a representative for Titan yes sir uh, formerly you were with the LAPD yes sir and prior to that US Marine Corps yes sir okay Con concurrently Concurrent or a portion. Yes, Understood. I, I was reviewing your CV, um, and it's true that you are not a psychiatrist, correct? Oh, no, sir. Okay. You don't have any psychological background, correct? No, sir. Uh, you don't have any psychological training, correct? No, sir. Uh, <coughs> you've, I know you've referenced a series of studies, but, but just to be clear, you've never conducted any of those studies yourself, no, correct? No, sir. Um, you've essentially reviewed them as, as one of the responsibilities of your job. Yes, sir. When I was reviewing through your CV, some of the things that I noticed is that you were a patrol supervisor for a portion of your time in LAPD, correct? That's how I ended it, sir. Okay, and, and so you were not a detective in that capacity, correct? Correct, sir. Okay, and, and, and I just, you know, listen, I'm familiar with, with Las Vegas PD, but a, a patrol supervisor, would it be fair to say that you might be kind of a supervising officer. You would go out to maybe a scene and work with patrol officers about preserving a scene, things of that nature. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, rather than, let's say, I don't know, a homicide detective who comes into a scene a little bit later if there's been a killing to kind of do the... Uh, yes, sir. ...kind of investigating. All right. Um, I know that you did some work in terms of a fire matter, subject matter, a firearm subject matter expert. Uh, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and, and it sounded like... 
you helped write policies and procedures to teach officers on how to handle ballistics as well as ammunition. Would that be accurate? Yes, sir. Was that for the majority of your time at the LAPD, or what, what yes, did sir. you do the bulk of your work at? It would have been at the firearms unit, uh, nine, 11 years, sir. Understood. You mentioned that as part of LAPD, you would assist command in reviewing information gathered from OISs, is that right? Yes, sir. And possibly provide them information about, as you said, potentially changes to policy, correct? Yes, sir. Or discipline, correct? Not the discipline itself, simply the facts leading. Understood. You didn't conduct any investigations in those OISs. You were collecting information from the actual investigators and then passing yes, along sir. to higher ups. Is that Correct. be accurate? Yes, sir. You didn't conduct any psychological evaluations of any of the officers involved in these OISs. Is that right? That's correct, sir. I want to talk a little bit about the materials that you reviewed in preparation for this case. Isn't it true that you reviewed an officer's report? Is that right? Yes, sir. You reviewed a video of a walkthrough of Mr. Randall. Yes, sir. And the other thing that you reviewed was some prior proceeding uh, from Detective O'Kelly. He testified at a prior proceeding, yes? Yes, sir. Okay. You did not have an opportunity to review Mr. Randolph's first interview with the police, correct? No, sir. Those are the only documents. You did not have an opportunity to review his second interview with police, correct? No, sir. You didn't review any recorded witness statements in this case? Only the video, sir. Okay. Um, you didn't review any video surveillance from this case? No, sir. You didn't review any 911 recordings from this case? Just the ones that were documented in the report, sir. And, and I understand that maybe some of these things are memorialized in the report. Yes, sir. But just to be clear, you didn't actually listen to the words that were coming out of people's mouths on 911, correct? correct? Sir. Yes, sir. You didn't review the autopsy report in this case? No, sir. Again, just what was in the uh, Officer O'Kelly's report. Okay. You would agree with me. Even, even, in, even in the context of going out to an OIS just to gather information, you would agree more information is better? Yes, sir. Because it gives you a bigger and more complete picture of what's actually happening? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and, and you would want to have the most information at your disposal when you're offering an opinion in court, correct? Yes, sir. Because that would give you the full picture? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you just briefly about your compensation. You're being paid, you were paid $350 an hour for each hour that you worked on the case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How many hours did you work on this case? 15. Okay. Oh boy. Let me do, let me, if you don't mind, I'm going to pull up my computer. I don't, I can't do that math. So that would amount to five thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. Is that correct? If, That's if, what if your I, calculator if I is telling you, sir. If I told you fifteen <laughs> times three fifty was that, and then it's four hundred and fifty dollars for every hour that you testify at trial. Yes, sir. Okay. Does that also include waiting? I don't know if it includes waiting or not, or just when you're sitting in the chair. Waiting too, sir. Okay. So how long have you been waiting? About four hours, sir. Okay. All right, so if we just did those four hours, that's another 1800 bucks. Fair? Don't tell my wife. Okay. All right, so all told, and we're not even including the time that you're sitting in the chair, we're at $7,050. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Now, the bulk of your testimony focused on Potential effects on officers being in critical incident situations, correct? Yes, sir. And general things that you might expect an officer to have happen to them when they're in one of those situations, correct? Have happened to their perception, yes, sir. And, and it would be fair to say that based on the vast majority of these OISs that you have looked at or examined or even experienced on your own, right, these circumstances have been thrust upon the officer or the person involved in this critical incident. Would that be correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so, 
So you're operating from a standpoint of, you know, the situation came to the person, correct? Yes. It's a very different situation than if the person involved in the shooting created the situation. You would agree, right? Yes. Because if the person created the situation, the circumstances aren't coming to them. They're creating the circumstance, right? Yes, sir. So, for example, if someone were to, I don't know, stage a shooting situation, that is an entirely different situation than, let's just say, a routine officer going out, coming upon a situation where people start firing at them, right? Yes, sir. You would agree with me that if you've staged the circumstances, you're not under the same stresses because you, you already know what's going to happen, right? Yes, sir. So if you planned on having someone, for example, be inside your home, you're not surprised when you walk in the door, right? Because you already knew and set that up, right? Yes, sir. Now, if someone was with you and was completely unaware of that, that might be a very different situation for your companion, correct? Yes, sir. Because they would have no idea, right? Yes, sir. But not you, not you, the person who staged it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So when they are discharging, the person who staged it is discharging a weapon, they're not going through necessarily the same stressors. And there may be some stressors, but maybe not the same as just a totally kind of out of the blue, whoa, what happened here? I'm getting, I'm, you know, as you were mentioning, you were kind of in the line of duty and someone's firing AK-47s at you out of the blue, right? Right. Very different situations, correct? Yes. And, and that's why context is key, correct? Yes, sir. That's why having the most information is really, really important, right? Yes, sir. And, and sometimes there can be, you would agree as an officer, um, there are motives that people might have for wanting to set up a crime, correct? Everybody's got motives, sir. Everyone's got motives. Uh, for example, I'm sure you understand this, money could be a huge motive to commit a crime, right? Yes, sir. If someone stood to gain hundreds of thousands of dollars from killing someone, that could be a motive to kill, right? Yes, sir. Love is another motive, right, detective? I'm sorry, not detective, officer? Sergeant. Sergeant, we'll go with sergeant, right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Love could drive someone to kill, correct? Yes, sir. And a really deadly cocktail could be money mixed with love, isn't that right? Yes, sir. That could drive someone to kill, right? Yes, sir. Desperation can be also a factor in committing a crime, right? Yes, sir. If someone is down on their luck, that could drive someone to do something desperate, right? Yes, sir. And if someone were staging a crime and identified someone down on their luck, that could be someone that you could work with to maybe accomplish your goals, correct? It seems reasonable, sir. Potentially promising this person money if they simply do a deed for them, correct? Yes, sir. In your years of working in law enforcement, I'm sure you have heard of people who have committed crimes to stand to gain life insurance money, correct? Yes, sir. That's a pretty common one, isn't it? it yes, sir. Right? Sometimes people take out not one, not two, but maybe even three policies out on a single person. You've heard of that, haven't you? I have heard of that, yes, sir. Sometimes people even stand to gain beyond life insurance, like homes or bank accounts, right? Yes, sir. Here's another reason that people might be able to do it, and you, you just correct me if I'm wrong. What if, what, sometimes there are situations where people want to get rid of people because they're putting them in bad financial situations, right? For example, let's say someone's driving you into debt. You might want to get rid of them, correct? Yes, sir. That could be a motive to want to commit a crime and erase that person out of the way, right? It seems reasonable, yes, sir. And in this case, you haven't had an opportunity to review any of the bank statements in this, correct? Correct, In sir. this case, correct? Yes, sir. So you don't know how much Mr. Randolph is in debt because you haven't seen that information, correct? That's correct, sir. You also don't know what he stood to gain because you haven't reviewed any possible life insurance policies or any potential wills that are involved in this case. Is that correct? Correct, sir. Okay. So at the end of the day, when we're dealing with the dynamics that you were talking about, that operates essentially from a person kind of thrust into a situation rather than staging it, correct? Yes, sir. But let's just, for the sake of argument, let's move to some of the things that you talked about. You talked about um, perceptual distortion. Um, and, and, and essentially, when people are in crisis mode, 
maybe when they're initially interviewed, they may not be able to get, er get all the details right, correct? Correct. One way of at least helping ameliorate that or helping that out is maybe giving them another opportunity to, to talk about the situation, maybe at a little time farther away from the actual incident. You would agree with that, correct? That's very common, yes, sir. You would agree that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be 100% correct, but one good tactic at least to maybe get uh, a more complete story or get a version of what happened that's a less stressful environment is to pace out when you're speaking to these people about the interviews, correct? Pace out? I don't want to... I don't want to... Sure. Give you an example. I understand that in OIS is you'll have an officer involved in a shooting uh, do a walkthrough at that point in time, correct? Right at, generally right after it happened, right? No, sir. There's usually a little bit of time. They give them a little bit of downtime. Generally. I guess it depends on the jurisdiction. I mean, yes, you'd sir. have no reason to disagree that sometimes officers here. Yes, sir. Okay. But if you give them another chance to come back and talk again, and I'm not saying it's done with law enforcement officers where they come back multiple times, but that could be one way of getting. Um, a less stressed out version of the events from the person involved in the shooting, correct? Sure, and it's also a way to get more information. Right, so if someone had been interviewed not once, not twice, but three times over the span of a month, that might be, you might get a little more of an accurate read on the situation than if you just did it one time immediately thereafter, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And one of the things that you mentioned was, uh, for example, uh, you mentioned auditory exclusions, right? Sometimes people say they go through things, and I think even you mentioned it, when you were going through a shooting event, you couldn't actually even hear the gunshots coming from your own gun, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, but sometimes there are people who do say, you know, oh, I did hear this or I did hear that, correct? Yes, sir. Sometimes they could be correct, sometimes it could be wrong, correct? Correct, sir. And if you had a recording of someone indicating whether they could hear something or not, that might be a good way to check to see if they heard something, right? If you had a recording of them. Of the, of, of. In the moment, where they're indicating whether they heard something or not, that could be a good resource to review, right? Yes, sir. Right, so if we had a recording of someone saying, I don't know, I heard the shot, that might be a good piece of evidence to rely upon. At least to maybe reference and double check what, what's happening there, right? Sure, yes, sir. Additionally, you mentioned Time distortion, correct? Yes, sir. For a lot of people, time tends to slow down for people, right? Yes, sir. So you would agree with me that it, it might be a good idea that if you have materials that might be able to objectively cross-reference or check what time things are happening, and that might be a good thing to look into, right? Yes, sir. So if someone said an event happened, and maybe you have phone records that might tie into that, that could be an additional supplementary source to look into a verifier, right? Absolutely, yes, sir. If you had, for example, like an eyewitness who isn't involved in any of the shooting but may have heard or saw things, that might be a good source to review to see and check with them, right? Yes, sir. And you could cross-reference it to see if things are checking out, right? Right. Let's talk about uh, distance distortions. You mentioned one of the things that people who, you know, if officers... They're not staging it, but let's just say an officer who's in a critical situation, um, they may not be able to perfectly get the distance, right? Correct. And, and that's a reasonable under, you know, expectation, right? Sure. Would you agree with me that one way if to, to maybe evaluate things like proximity is to maybe go to the scene where these things are purportedly supposed to happen and, and get a good look and document, like, how big is the space? Are we in a field? Are we in a room? Are we in a hallway? Things like that. Yes, sir. Right? That would be a good way to at least evaluate some of these things, correct? Yes, sir. Because then you'd be able to know objectively if someone in, is in close proximity or, or are they really far away, right? Yes, sir. And, and, and same thing, I think you mentioned distance to object. Again, going to a scene... Measuring out a scene, observing a scene is another good way to at least cross-reference that rather than relying solely on the word of the person that's relaying the information. Yes.
you mentioned that in your in your line of work, even with officers, that there may be approximately ninety five percent of officers relaying some detail that is distorted. Correct. Yes, sir. If I if I heard you correctly, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, you're not saying that when these officers relay kind of that an event happened, that every single thing that they said just couldn't be relied on whatsoever. You're not saying that, are no, you? No, sir. You're saying, like, you gave a great example about, like, oh, you know, someone didn't quite get the color of the suspect's hat right, right? Yes, sir. Right, but if someone is kind of saying, look, I'm standing in this general area, and I did this, and then they're interviewed again, they said, I'm standing in this general area, and I did this, and then they are interviewed a third time, and they say, I'm standing here, and I did this, that's a little bit different, correct? You're referring to the consistency over... Yes. Yes, sir. So if someone is telling you, this is where I am, you you might tend to believe that, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and then you mentioned that um, in less trained individuals, you believe, in your opinion, that they may be more prone to have more distortion than someone who's trained, correct? That is what I've seen uh, as a trainer for the last 30 years. And, and, and let me, let's, if you don't mind, if I just want to delve into that a little bit. You're not, you haven't conducted any studies with, with regular civilians, have you? No, sir. Okay. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying it's not necessarily true, but I just want to kind of get, get the, kind of nail this down. You haven't done any studies, you haven't done any psychological examinations, correct, of any civilians on this? No, sir, I'm not issue. qualified to do that. Okay. Um, and, 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 and to be fair, I mean, there are citizens that go through traumatic events all the time, correct? Correct. So, for example, here in Las Vegas, we, we had one October, right? Those people went through a number of horrible things. But, I mean, if they recall, look, I'm generally here and these are the things that are happening. I mean, they're not 100% off base on that, correct? Right. They may have a couple details wrong here or there. Yes, sir. But if they're, you know, the big moments they're likely remembering, Correct. I couldn't speak to everyone, but it, it would, it seems like this, the stories would kind of bear out the big general things. And, and, and Sergeant, again, when we're talking about those type of individuals, those are individuals when the crisis is thrust upon them, correct? Yes, sir. We're not talking about an individual that has planned and staged it. Isn't that right? That's correct, sir. Thank you. I have no further questions. Do you know what you were retained to do in this case? Yes, sir. Um, you know that you're an expert witness, right? Yes, sir. You know in order to testify in a case like this, there's a notice that's filed that announces that you're an expert witness, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you know that you were noticed as a use of, for, use of force expert, right? Yes, sir. And you are that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and you were noticed to provide opinions about the effects on someone in a dynamic shooting situation, such as sequencing, placement, and recall. Yes, sir. And you have the ability to do that, right? Yes, sir. Um, you were provided with a limited number of pieces of information, right? Yes, sir. Because you weren't here to investigate what happened in a case like this, right? Yes, sir. I mean, you certainly, Mr. Hamner, that's the prosecutor's name, never met him, right? No, sir. Met me for the first time today, right? Yes, sir. Okay. A few weeks ago, I emailed you some documents and said, take a look at this, and we're going to call you to testify, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you understand that the jury, when you testify in a trial, is the group of people that decide what happened, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And certainly, they're capable of doing that, right? Yes, sir. You understand that a prosecutor can get up here and give you a million scenarios about what you're not noticed to do, what you're not provided with information to do. Um, spinning his own motive. You understand that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, a lot of people have motivations for things, right? Yes, sir. For instance, if someone, I don't know, shot your wife in the head in her own home, you might want to fight back, right? Yes, sir. Um, and in that situation, um, you don't choose what happened to you, right? I mean, there's a, a binary option at the beginning. You can run away, but... If, if you're perceiving a threat, no, there's there's no choice. You're going to fight. Okay. And if you fight, um, statistically speaking, you're probably not going to get every detail right, correct? Correct. You might get the large number of them right. Yes, correct? sir. And if you're being honest, you might say things like, I don't have any idea how many times I shot, right? Yes, sir. 
or I think I was in this area, right? Yes, sir. And you could get it a step or two wrong, right? Yes, sir. Does that mean you're lying? No, sir. It's pretty normal, isn't it? That's very typical, sir. Were you trying to lie when you gave information in an investigation related to the Bronze Star? No, sir. Did you get a few things wrong? Yes, sir. Did you get the majority of it right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Hamner asked you about your compensation. You're a professional who's being paid for your work, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So am I. So is she. So are they. Like, you understand that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, as a law enforcement officer, were you ever called to the stand to testify? Yes, sir. How many times? Hundreds. Okay. As an expert witness, have you ever been called to the stand to testify? As a, with the department, I testified as an expert witness uh, three times, sir. On behalf of law enforcement as an expert? Yes, right? sir. Have you ever in your life testified as an expert for a defendant in a criminal case before? No, sir. Okay. In this particular case, were you given a walkthrough video? Yes, sir. Okay. And it's a video where someone is asked to act out the sequencing, location, and events of a dynamic situation. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen a law enforcement officer have to do that? N not on video, no, sir. I had asked you about this walkthrough video. You had an opportunity to see it, right? Yes, sir. So was the jury. Have you ever seen a law enforcement officer have to do that same type of walkthrough for an evidentiary reason? No, sir. It would be unfair and unreliable, wouldn't it? Objection. That's an improper opinion. Also an improper opinion. I don't think we it calls for it. You agree with me that you reviewed the walkthrough video in this case as it relates to the use of force expertise that you have, right? Yes, sir. And you agree with me that type of evidence is unreliable, right? Objection. It's an cause for improper opinion. It definitely does not. You agree with that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the situations that you mentioned before, where law enforcement does a walkthrough. They're compelled and required to do that, right? Yes, sir. You know that Mr. Randolph wasn't required to do that interview. Yes, sir. Okay. He was trying to help law enforcement, right? Yes, sir. Calls for okay. On that video, he indicates that he's uh, cooperating with law enforcement. He's there of his own free will, right? Yes, sir. Um, and it appears that he answers their questions in that walkthrough. Yes, sir. You would agree with me that the idea that being able to recount a dynamic critical force situation like that with specificity on things like location, sequencing, timing, probably pretty unlikely, isn't it? it yes, sir. Unlikely. Testified on redirect examination that, in your opinion, the walkthrough was unreliable. You just said that two seconds ago. Yes. No, yes or no? Yes. That's your testimony. You made that determination even though you didn't review the interview, the first interview, correct? 
Yep. Yes or no? You didn't review the first interview, did you? No, sir. You didn't review the second interview, did you? No, sir. You didn't review a shred of video surveillance, correct? Correct, sir. You didn't read any bank statements? Correct, sir. You didn't read any life insurance policies? Correct, sir. You didn't read any recorded witness statements from anybody who had a recorded interview, correct? Correct, sir. Okay. You would agree me. You told me on cross-examination more information is better, correct? Yes, sir. You said that you prefer having more information before you render opinions in cases that you're hired to do things, correct? Yes, sir. You have been paid $7,000 to render an opinion, and you didn't review any of those materials, correct? Correct, sir. You would agree with me those might be pretty important information before you tell this jury that you think that walkthrough is unreliable, correct? Sir, uh, it yes wasn't no. relevant yes to no. what yes I was talking no. about. Uh, oh. Yes or no, do you think it would be pretty good for you to have all of that other information to review before you make the call that the walkthrough is unreliable? No, sir. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Bank statements, witness interviews, other memorializations of reports have to do with an investigation, right? Yes, sir. Does that have anything to do whatsoever with a statistical representation that there is perceptual distortion no, in sir. a shooting incident? No. Would any of that stuff help you with the opinions that you were actually noticed to give? No. Other than all the flair and the drama of Mr. Hamner, that stuff has nothing to do with your job, right? No, sir. Okay. Nothing further. Um, police psychiatrists. Who are the studies you reference paid by? I don't have that information. How big were the data sets in each of the studies you referenced? They ranged. The smallest was 25, the largest was uh, 962, I believe, thereabouts. Mr. Chum, can you follow up based on your question? Um, in addition to the, you, know, you mentioned that the majority of the studies were police psychiatrists. Uh, psychologists, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You also reviewed um, a summary of studies conducted by the University of Prague. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's the largest conglomeration of yes, sir. different studies. It, it's, a, it's, it's an easy compilation to review. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Start time tomorrow. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including federal jurors, in any way.
legislated regarding the case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, or listen to any news or media accounts or commentary about the case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate the aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form or express any opinion regarding this case on the final submitted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 445. We're going to recess till 450. All rise for the jury.
eyes for the jury. to wrap this up and make sure you guys will be out of here by Friday just like I promised you. But in order to do that, we have to fluctuate the scheduling a little bit. So tomorrow we're going to convene at 11.30, but we will not be breaking for lunch, so I need you guys to eat before you get here if you don't mind. We will be breaking in the afternoon so you guys can have a snack, but we are not going to have an hour and a half lunch, but we're not starting until 11.30, so I need you guys here tomorrow morning at 11.30. Okay? All right for the jury.